would um, get your attention. Uh, appreciate everybody coming down, and I want to call to order the October 28th Metropolitan Planning Commission. Uh, hope you guys are doing well. I have a, just a couple of announcements before we get into the agenda. And so the first is, um, it's, it's my honor and my privilege to welcome the councilman, Brett Weathers, East Nashville Councilman to the Planning Commission. He is going to be with us for the next two years, uh, being the, councilman's, uh, the council member's rep. And so we appreciate the double duty. Um, I'm not sure if we can double your salary, but uh, we do appreciate uh, you being here, Brett. So thank you very much and uh, look forward to working with you. Next, um, just masks are required still per the executive order. I appreciate everybody wearing them. Uh, it's our duty to help each other stay healthy. Um, so I do appreciate that. Um, if you don't have a mask, we have some. So we appreciate uh, everybody doing that. So thank you very much uh, for, for doing that. Next, um, there's been a lot of talk and I'm sure you've read about redistricting. Um, you can find more uh, about redistricting here in Metro Nashville, which includes only the school districts and only the Metro Council districts. And you can, school board districts. And so you can find that at redistrict.nashville.gov. And so um, if you have questions, obviously you can call the Planning Commission. Uh, and Greg Claxton is our, our lead from the Planning Commission who's leading that effort. We want your input, uh, we appreciate your input, um, and so thank you for, for being involved in that. Um, so, I, I have a personal privilege, it's probably out of order, um, but I don't know if, if any of you went to the Monday night football game, but I was there, and it was some of the best energy I have seen at the stadium for several years. And uh, so I just want to say go Titans. Uh, appreciate, <laughs> appreciate the excitement that night. So, so sorry, that was out of order. Okay. Um, so we'll get into uh, the adoption of the agenda. So commissioners, uh, you, you have seen the agenda. Is there a motion to adopt? There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. The agenda is adopted. Next is item C, which is the approval of the October 14th, 2021 minutes. Those were sent out to you prior. And so any edits, comments, additions? So we'll need a motion to approve the minutes. Is there a motion? There's a motion. Second. Any discussion on the minutes? Seeing no discussion, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. And the minutes are adopted. And just so you know, there are six uh, commissioners. Uh, so we we detect a quorum. Want to make sure we get that for our attorney. Next, we go to the recognition of the council members, item D. And so we go by uh, just who is we saw first. I saw Councilman Mendez first. Come on up. Thank you for coming, sir. Um, thanks for uh, your service. Um, I'm here on item 18, 7848 McCrory Lane, um, speaking in favor and asking you to uh, approve it. On its face, this seems like it should be an easy matter. The council member wants it. The community, as you're going to hear tonight, overwhelmingly supports it. And the planning staff recommended approval. They recommended approval according to the documentation. Um, for a change from AR2A to R80 um, because it's consistent with the T2 rural maintenance um, policy in the area. And so why, why is this um, going to draw a crowd today? Why is this going to draw a lot of comments? And that's because the, the owner, um, who I'm not sure whether they're here tonight, but the owner wants to um, uh, is complaining that it's a down zoning, that it's inappropriate. And of course, as an at-large council member, I consider that uh, alarming. And so when I heard that from the owner, I, I looked into it. And what I've seen is that 
Um, this property is currently subject to SP zoning that was passed in June of 2007 that specifically prohibits um, the use of off-site materials of any type to fill the quarry that's on there. And of course, that's what the owner is wanting to do. And so changing the zoning here um, is A, consistent with the uh, T2 rural maintenance policy, and it's also consistent with the existing um, SP from 2007, um, and that's BL 2006-1297. Nine seven and it and again quote says quote no dumping or fill of any offsite materials of any type shall be permitted in the quarry site. Secondly, I went and uh, talked to uh, Metro Legal to figure out whether there's any way that this is a taking, and I think you'll probably hear later that their position is that it's not a taking. So between the community um, overwhelmingly wanting the change between it being consistent with the T2 rural maintenance policy in effect between the uh, and the fact that this maintains the the zoning change maintains what's in the SP about no offsite materials used to fill the quarry this should be a no-brainer and I hope that you decide to um, uh, recommend approval of this in accordance with the staff recommendation and again, I thank you for letting me go out of order. I need to run to another community meeting. I'm happen, happy to answer any questions or um, just uh, leave you to it. Thank you. Appreciate it, Councilman. Appreciate, Appreciate you it. being here. I saw Councilmember Gamble. I saw. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for your service. I would like to speak on item 31 and 32 on your agenda. Uh, the first one, the request to rezone uh, from RS20 to R10 and RS40 to RS80, rather, zoning for various properties on Brick Church Pike. This is a collaborative effort with about 25 or so residents uh, in this area wanting to downzone their property. Uh, which is in line with the with the current policy, the T2 rule policy of the area. Uh, this is an effort to preserve the rural character of the area. I'm in support of it. It's about 655 acres that is being requested to rezone from the RS20 and R10 and RS40 to the RS80 zoning, uh, which, as I said, is in line with the policy and supports uh, the the initiative to preserve the real character. So I support this uh, this plan and ask for your support in it as well. The second one, number 32, a request to rezone from SP to AR2 property on uh, properties located on Clarksville Pike. I actually would like to defer this one uh, for at least two meetings until the January meeting. And the reason why is the um, this property had a, a SP on it that uh, was outdated and canceled, and we were looking at rezoning it to the base zoning, which is the AR2A. However, uh, the developers would like to still still develop this property, and so I'd like to work with them in the community to see if there's another appropriate zoning that we may rezone to as opposed to the AR2A. So I'd like to defer that one until the January meeting. Pardon Which me. number was that, Councilor? That was number 32-2021-Z-111-PR-001. 20, hold, on, hold on one second, okay. Councilor, so you're requesting item 32 to be deferred one meeting or? Well, at least until the January meeting. I think you have one in November and one in December. So Lisa, what, me, how many meetings two, is that? To January, two the meetings. January meeting. Uh, three meetings. Three to, meetings. To the January 13th meeting. And and I'm assuming that the that you'll also be deferring the public hearing at Council to match yes. that timeline. Yes. Okay. And and Councilor, you're the applicant. That's fine. We, okay. we really appreciate you doing that. We'll... Thank you. Lisa, will you add that to the deferral list? Perfect. That's all I have. Thank, Thank you, you so Council Lady. We appreciate it.
All right. So the next councilman I saw was Councilman Freddie O'Connell. Come on up. Welcome. Thank you, and I hope my attire is satisfactory to the chair. Um, I'm trying not to create a new habit of appearing before you regularly, but there are a few notable items on today's agenda that I want to draw special attention to. Um, the first is 2017 SP 091003, Connect Nashville. I mentioned it briefly at last meeting. Um, it is supported by policy. Uh, that said, uh, I can't detect any community support for this request, and so I think it is worth listening to the concerns of residents there. Um, I know the applicant is coming in with a reduction in the number of permits sought at 50% of uh, potential units, but I think there are some concerns where we may want to look at uh, could we reduce that number of, of permits sought um, or otherwise find ways to, to reduce the level of community opposition to this. Um, so just pay attention to the discussion on that one. Um, next is 2021Z012TX001. Um, this item would apply existing hospitality use parking standards to short-term rental permits for non-owner occupied units upon application. Um, STRPs are an interesting example of a permitted use where the awarding of the permit effectively transforms a previously residential use into a commercial hospitality use. Um, I'm certainly open to a discussion as Nashville continues to grow where we consider relaxing hospitality parking standards across the board. Uh, but in the meantime, a constant thread of concern I've heard in neighborhoods where entire complexes are created for short-term rental uses with much lower parking standards uh, is that streets fill up with people parking for the STRs. Uh, this proposal, in fact, arose from a working group in Germantown, uh, and you've, you'll see a couple of items on deferral still um, that were related to that discussion as well that consisted of residents, realtors, and developers. And I think it's a good common sense proposal that will help Nashville's neighborhoods, particularly in urban contexts. Um, I've already requested amendments that would move the effective date to January 1st, 2022, which would align with the effective date of BL 2019-1633, um, as well as to make an allowance for any project with other applicable permits submitted to Metro Codes by that date to proceed, as we've also recently done with BL 2019-1633. I encourage the Commission to approve this item. Uh, item 2021 SP 079001. Uh, you've heard about already, this is a critical specific plan district proposal supporting the restoration of 2nd Avenue after last year's Christmas Day bombing. This involved a thoughtful negotiation with the Callan family uh, that owns these parcels and has involved planning, Metro Historic, myself, the mayor's office, the Civic Design Center, and other stakeholders, uh, all interested in restoring character and avoiding a future where a surface parking lot becomes a part of the streetscape uh, at a devastated portion of downtown Nashville that is historic. I think the designs suggest a very bright future, and I encourage you to approve this item. Finally, 2021 DTC 022001 proposes to enhance both Printer's Alley and Banker's Alley, transforming a parking structure uh, into a use that should dramatically improve the experience of anyone traversing Nashville's interesting network of downtown alleys. With recent adaptive reuse projects in the area, I think we do have a chance going forward to preserve even more of the character of 3rd Avenue North, and I encourage planning to approve this item. Thank you all for your service and your consideration. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate you coming down. Next, uh, I saw Council Lady Hurt. You want to come on up? Welcome. Good afternoon, and thank you all so much for allowing me to greet you this afternoon. All right. And uh, I thank you all for your service. I'm here with a dual role. I come as a resident of the Bellevue community, and I come as a council member who has heard from the community in regards to item 18, the bill uh, 2021-906. My council member, Dave Rosenberg, we stand in support of the proposed zoning that he has put forth and ask that you do the same. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council. All right, so here's the deal. Here's the deal. We are a professional organization, right? We're, we're not here to, it's, this is not appropriate place for a protest. 
it's an appropriate place to give public comment, which every single one of you, if you want to comment, you can. But clapping and cheering and we'll stop, we'll stop the meeting. We'll take a pause. So, and I'll ask you to be removed. So it's a professional meeting. We want everybody to have equal say and time allotted per our rules. And so I appreciate y'all doing that for us. We want you to hear the facts of both sides as well. We have to hear that as well. And so please no clapping. We'll go through the process. So I really appreciate it. Deal? Okay, we'll try it. All right, so next I saw Councilman Rosenberg. Do you wanna go now or? Yeah, I, I, we'll get to her last. Let's make sure, uh, I think it's appropriate. I've had the attorney look at our rules. We don't, uh, it's it's a courtesy to let elected, current elected speak. Uh, so I think that's appropriate. So w if there's no objection from the commission, I'm seeing no objection. So we'll get to you, Senator. Uh, what, let, let's get all the council, make sure we get all the councilmen first and then we'll let you speak, okay? Are there, did I see any other council members? It's hard to, tell with all the masks on sometimes and this many people. So I don't think I saw any other council members. Lisa, do you see any? Okay. I don't see any others. All right. So Senator, come on up. Welcome. Please tell us your name and appreciate right. you coming down. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate uh, you letting me come in here. We're Coming down, Representative Mitchell and I are coming down from a special session right now that makes me very happy to see a room full of masked people and possibly vaccinated people. So it's wonderful to see you today, it really is. Um, I came here uh, with an apology and an appeal. And so my apology is that um, I was elected in November and it's been a steep learning curve. And I was on a committee where I voted for a bill that I regret having voted for which actually is uh, related to Macquarie Lane and um, the filling of a quarry. And so it was explained to me, and this is my lesson learned, that this uh, filling of the quarry bill was actually for the sake of getting rid of um, natural road refuse um, and other parts of the state. And I was not aware that this was actually an attempt to circumvent a promise that was made um, by some developers to the city of Nashville in return for being allowed to build um, a development. So that having been said, I, I come to you with that apology. I, that, I'm sorry that, about that vote, though it would have passed unsurprisingly if I had voted against it, but, um, and an appeal to please um, pass Councilman Rosenberg's nullification bill, um, which, uh, I mean, not nullification bill, um, Bayes' zoning bill, um, to right my wrong. So I ask you to please do that because I think that, um, that the people that are here and the people that live in that neighborhood would appreciate it if their beautiful environment was not um, destroyed by having that quarry filled up. So thank, thank you. you very much. And since we extended the courtesy to you, I, I, I want to make sure we extend the courtesy to Representative Mitchell as well. You want to wait? Okay. Thank, thank you, Representative. Appreciate that. I want to make sure we, we're fair to everyone. Uh, any other council members? All right. Seeing no other council members, we are on item E, which is items for deferral withdrawal. Lisa? The following items are for deferral or withdrawal. Item number one, 2018 SP 009003. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 18th meeting. Item number two, 2020 Z 013TX 001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 9th planning commission meeting. Item number three on page four of your agenda, 2020 Z 119 PR 001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 9th meeting. Item number four, 2021 SP 052001. 
Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 18th meeting. Item number five, 2021 SP 057001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 18th meeting. Item number six, 2021 SP 068001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 18th meeting. Item number seven, 2021 SP 077001. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item number eight, 2021 NL003001. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely, and that's on page five of your agenda. Item number nine, 2021Z077PR001. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item number 10, 2021Z108PR001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 18th meeting. Item number 11, 2021S161001. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item number 12, 2021S195001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 18th meeting. Item number 13 on page 6 of your agenda, 2021CP007003. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item number 14A, 2021CP010002. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 18th meeting. The associated case 14B, 2021SP071001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 18th meeting. Item 15A, 2021SP009001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the, no, to the December 9th meeting. The associated case on page 7, 15B, 7874P003. Staff recommendation is to defer to the December 9th meeting. Item number 16, 2021Z018TX001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 18th meeting. Item number 22, 2021Z013TX001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 18th meeting. Item number 29, 2021Z105PR001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 18th meeting. Item number 30, 2021Z107PR001. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. And item number 32 on page 10 of your agenda, 2021Z111PR001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 13th meeting. Thank you, Lisa. So we, we've got a long list, so make sure we get these right. So the items for deferral are withdraw and withdraw are items 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14A, 14B, 15A, 15B, 16, 22, 29, 30, and 32. Is that correct? That's correct. And I also wanted to note for those in the audience and watching at home that the November 18th meeting will be located at the school board um, meeting room on Bransford Avenue. Okay, and that will be posted. Yes. Uh, we'll post it like we normally yes. do. So Correct. thank you for that reminder. All right, commissioners, you've heard the items for deferral withdrawal. Is there a motion? There's a motion. Is there a second? Any discussion on those items for deferral withdrawal? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. Those items are deferred. All right, so now we are on to item F, which is the consent agenda. As, as notice to the public, items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. I'm going to read through the items that are noted as being tentatively on consent. If anyone in the audience is opposed to one of the items that I read off, please raise your hand and then that item will be presented at the time that it comes up on the agenda. 
Item number 19, 2021Z003TX001. Is there anyone opposed to item number 19? Item number 20, 2021Z011TX001. Uh, Lisa, you need to talk into the microphone. I'm sorry. sorry. There you go. Yeah, we can't hear. Item you. number 20, 2021Z011TX001. Is there anyone opposed to item number 20? Item number 21, 2021Z012TX001. Is there anyone opposed to item 21? Item number 23, 2021Z015TX001. Is there anyone opposed to item 23? Item number 24, 2021SP07601. Is there anyone opposed to item 24? Item number 25, 2021SP079001. Is there anyone opposed to item number 25? Item number 26, 2021DDU001001. Is there anyone opposed to item number 26? Okay. Item number 26 will be presented. Item number 27, 2021 HL003001. Is there anyone opposed to item number 27? Item number 28, 2021Z095PR001. Is there anyone opposed to item 28? Item number 31, 2021Z, 110PR001. Is there anyone opposed to item number 31? Opposed to 31? We'll present item 31. Item number 33. 5083P001. Is there anyone opposed to item number 33? Item number 34, 2021DTC00200. I'm sorry. 2021DTC022001. Is there anyone opposed to item number 34? Item number 35, 2021S186001. Is there anyone opposed to item number 35? And item number 36, 2013UD002034. Is there anyone opposed to item number 36? Okay, Chair, I'm going to go through and read the captions on all of those now. Thank you. As information for our audience, if you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Planning Commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the Planning Commission's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. The following items are on the consent agenda. Item number 19 on page 7 of your agenda, 2021Z003, TX001. It's a request to amend the zoning code to require additional public notice regarding applications for permits to the Historic Zoning Commission. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 20 on page 8 of your agenda, 2021Z011, TX001. It's in an ordinance to amend the zoning code to amend the requirements for residential floor area ratio bonus. Staff recommendation is to disapprove the substitute ordinance as filed and recommend approval of a proposed second substitute. 
Item number 21, 2021Z012TX001. This is a request for an ordinance to amend the Metro, to, metro, to amend the zoning code to amend the definition of short-term rental property not owner-occupied and amend parking requirements related to short-term rental property not owner-occupied. Staff recommendation is to approve the amendments to Title 17. Item number 23, 2021Z015TX001. It's a request to amend the zoning code um, to amend the regulations of demolitions of potentially historic structures and sites. Staff recommendation is to approve the amendments to Title 17. Item number 24, 2021 SP 076001, 1738 Lebanon Pike. This is a request to rezone from RS10 to SP for property located on Lebanon Pike to permit 52 multifamily units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 25, 2021 SP 079001, 170 through 176 7, 2nd Avenue North. This is a request to rezone from DTC to SP for properties located at 170 through 176 2nd Avenue North to permit a mixed use development. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 27 on page nine of your agenda, 2021 HL 003001. It's a request to apply a historic landmark overlay district to property located at 435 Old Hickory Boulevard. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 28, 2021Z095PR001. It's a request to rezone from RS5 to R6A for property located on Joseph Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 33 on page 10 of your agenda, 5083P001. It's a request to cancel a commercial plans unit development for property located on Church Street. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 34, 2021 DTC 022001, Printers and Bankers Alley. It's a request for an overall height modification for properties located on 3rd Avenue North. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 35, 2021S186001, Trinity Monticello Homes. It's a request for final plat approval to create five lots on property located on West Trinity Lane and Monticello Drive. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. And item number 36 on page 11, your agenda, 2013UD002034, KIPP High School. It's a request to modify the Murfreesboro Pike Urban Design Overlay for properties located on Murfreesboro Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve modifications of facade width along Pinhook Road, the facade requirement along Murfreesboro Pike, and number of pedestrian access points, and disapprove without all conditions. Under other business, item number 37, confirmation of Ron Yearwood to the DTC DRC, and item number 41 to accept the director's report. Thank you, Lisa. And here again, we'll go slow to make sure we, uh, commissioners, that we get this, this right. So the items for the consent agenda to be passed uh, would be items number 19, 20, 21, 23, 24, 25, 27, 28, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, and 41. Is that correct? Yes, Chairman, that's correct. All right, commissioners, you've heard the items on the consent agenda. We'll need a motion to adopt the consent agenda. There, there's a motion from the vice chair. Second. Second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and the consent agenda is adopted. And so the, so the items that we're going to hear tonight are four items, items 17, 18, 26, and 31. Is that correct, Lisa? Yes. That's correct. Okay. Perfect. And as folks leave, there are seats up here, and it would be great if everybody could. There's plenty of room, so come on up, get a chair. That way you're not blocking the 
entrance and exit. Let's try to get everybody. There's a lot of chairs up front. So anybody in the back, if we could have the staff help us kind of move people forward a little bit. Let's get situated. Uh, there's there's a lot more chairs up front. Don't be shy. Come on up. It's like the price of right. Come on up. We'll, we'll just take a minute to get transitioned here. I know it takes a minute to get everybody situated. All right, everybody. Appreciate y'all's patience. So we are on to item 17. So again, we're going to hear items 17, 18, 26, and 31. And so we are ready for Good evening, Commission. Hey, Logan. Yes, thank you, Chair. Go ahead. Great. Uh, my name is Logan Elliott at the Planning Department, and I'll be presenting item 17 tonight. The request is to amend the Connect Midtown SP to permit short-term rental, uh, not owner-occupied, as a permitted land use. Staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. The site is zone SP. Hey, Logan, but yes, talk sir. into the microphone. We, you just yes. make, make sure we can hear you. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Sure. Go ahead. Still adjusting this sitting down. Um, site is zoned SP, and the project has been constructed. As approved, the SP currently permits a maximum of 420 multifamily units and a maximum of 24,000 square feet of non-residential uses. The non-residential uses include full-service restaurant, takeout restaurant, general office, and leasing slash sales office. The surrounding parcels that front onto Division Street are zoned mixed-use intensive alternative, with the parcels to the east that front onto 18th Avenue South zoned office residential intensive alternative. The SP directly to the south has also been constructed and is a similar mixed-use development with similar intensity. The policy for the site is a T5 center mixed use neighborhood. And this policy describes that these areas are intended to be among the most intense areas in Davidson County with a diverse mix of residential and non-residential uses. The site is also within the Music Row Vision Plan and falls within the 1B subdistrict. The 1B subdistrict describes recommended uses as mixed use with active retail bars, restaurants, office, live music venues, hotels, and residential. Uh, neither the T5 mixed use or T5 center mixed use neighborhood policy or the music row vision plan speak to short term rentals specifically. Looking at the approved plan and constructed plan, the floor area ratio for this project is about 10 with a maximum height of 20 stories. The building has a vehicular access taken from 19th Avenue South with the pedestrian entrance also being located on 19th Avenue South. The non-residential uses encompass the majority of the ground floor of the building. The project was approved with the valet location on 19th Avenue and this has not been realized yet. The applicant has agreed that prior to the issuance of any short-term rental permits, an application shall be made with the Traffic and Parking Commission to consider converting on-street parking spaces on 19th Avenue South to a rideshare pickup slash drop-off location. The recommendation of 
the Traffic and Parking Commission should be completed prior to the issuance of any short-term rental permit should, uh, should the Traffic and Parking Commission make a recommendation. When this SP was approved, I would like to note that short-term rental property was a specific use listed in the zoning code, and the SP bill did not specify that this use was permitted. The SP bill limited the uses to those that I mentioned earlier and to the uses noted in the staff report. Uh, since the adoption of this SP and the construction of the project, the zoning code has been further amended to include both owner-occupied and no, not owner-occupied short-term rental as a permitted land use. Staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. The proposed amendment to this SP is consistent with the intent of the T5 center mixed-use neighborhood policy to create an intense mixed-use district with a diverse mix of residential and non-residential land uses. And that completes my presentation. I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Logan. We'll go ahead and open this item for public hearing. And is the applicant ready? Come on up. Uh, you know the drill. You've got 10 minutes, and you can save two of the 10 minutes for rebuttal. State your name and address. For uh, Larry Papel, 4320 Signal Hill Drive, Nashville. I am counsel to Acara Partners, which is the applicant. If you can just talk in, we're, you know, with the mask, you got to talk a little closer. I'll get a little there closer. There you go. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have with me Tim Franzen from Acara Partners. He is the COO of Acara Partners. I'm going to just say a few introductory words and then turn it over to him. And he, he has a deck where he'll give you a tour of this building and describe the program. Uh, and yes, we do want to reserve two minutes for rebuttal if necessary. Uh, CAR applied for the SP zoning for this project in 2017. Uh, it's, it was approved. I think, Lucy, was one of the first things you worked on when you got to Nashville uh, with, as Logan said, 24,000 of mixed use and 420 residential units. Uh, S, uh, STRP was not discussed at the time. Of course, the rules were different. Uh, the ordinances were different. It was neither asked for or denied. It just wasn't part of the equation at the time. Uh, the ACARA project, as you see, is in Midtown. It's in the T5 mixed use district, the 1B subdistrict. It is an area where the policy is for the most intense uses outside of the downtown core. And of course, there are the density in the area, residential and non residential, has increased pursuant to that policy. Um, The, I think it's important to note that the, uh, if, if STRP non-owner is um, approved here, it doesn't mean there are going to be more beds and heads here or that there would be any more intense use of this property than is already there. Because uh, there are 420 units. We've only asked for up to 50 percent to be eligible for STRP permits, but the program, the building will impose programs that will limit the use through STRP. No more than two people per unit on any night. There is plenty of parking in this building, so off-street or on-street parking is not an issue with STRP permit applications here, and um, it, it just would have a minimal effect on the neighborhood. It would be self-contained. Uh, also, the, the units in this building, as Tim will tell you, um, there are 63 bedroom units. None of those will be permitted, or none of those would be in the pool. No, no STRP permits would be asked for those units. Uh, the rest of the units are either one bedrooms or studios. So it's two people per, per unit. Uh, and we're glad to agree to that limitation. ACARA runs, runs this building. And they will impose two programs for STRP. 
I'm going to let Tim describe them, but guest suites, guest suite programs, and home sharing. Guest suites will be units that are not rented out full time or for a year or so. They will just be used for STRP, clustered on one floor and limited. Home sharing is to allow people with long term leases the ability to monetize the time when they're not there for whatever reason, whether it's a student gone for the summer or a roadie in the music business. Uh, it gives them an, it reduces their cost of occupancy. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tim, and he'll run you through. Thanks, Tim, and watch the clock, because at two minutes, you start Absolutely. running. Absolutely. I'm going to try to take you, it, do I use the buttons here to, to switch to the slides? I'll change it. You'll change the slides. So I'm going to take you on a quick tour and just try to keep up, I think. Thank you, Logan. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for your time tonight. Uh, Tim Franz with the Car Partners. I mentioned that uh, earlier with, uh, with Larry. Uh, so I'll show you a take quick tour, tour through here of the building. First of all, we're a very different building than most residential buildings here in Nashville in that we have dedicated co-working space as amenity for our residents. We'll talk about that in a bit. We do a lot more programming events to keep our our residents uh, engage with each other. We do a lot of in-person fitness classes. We're happy we can actually do in-person fitness classes finally again, which is really exciting for us. We've got massive fitness centers. You can see the pool deck there. So there's a lot more going on here uh, for everyone. Where they might have to go out and buy you know, a gym club membership, a social club membership, a co-working membership. They get that all for one rent check. So it makes the co their cost of living here in Nashville much more affordable. So we can go right through here. This is a lobby here. It's very much more like a very, very kind of hospital, or not hospital, it can be a hotel type of lobby, very expansive there, a lot of seating area. We can keep going. There's another shot of the lobby here with a local muralist who did a mural for us there. If we keep, go keep on going, this is part of our co-working space on the second floor. These are both floating desks or float stations and dock stations. Uh, every one of our residents gets to use a, a floating desk as part of the rent. If they want to pay a little more, they can get a dedicated desk or a private office, just like any other co-working space. We'll go on. We've got a coffee lounge here and a, dem de a demonstration kitchen for our residents to be using. If we keep going... Another coffee station, some more float desk, desk stations there. Uh, one of our fitness centers is actually a fitness studio. We do a, a lot of our in-person fitness classes. The next one is of our, our fitness gym, uh, where there's more fitness equipment if we keep going. You can keep going. This is our resident uh, social lounge. Also has another demonstration kitchen where we do lots of cocktail uh, events or, or you know, cooking demonstrations sort of thing. If we keep going, we'll see our pool deck outside here. This is a beautiful pool deck, sun deck. If we keep going, you'll see our cabanas. If we keep going, you'll see an outdoor uh, resident lounge and community garden. There's actually a community garden behind the little evergreen trees you see there where our residents can grow their own flowers and vegetables. This is our bark park, so we try to you know, make sure the neighborhood's clean of our, our Fido's uh, doings, and so they, this is where the, the dogs get to play. Uh, this is one of our uh, one-bedroom units. The next one will be of our studio unit. Next one is another look at our studio unit where we have a Murphy bed in, on the left-hand side. As I'm looking at it is with the Murphy bed up. On the right-hand side, is, it's down. It's a very efficient living there. And then I'll go into the short-term rental programs uh, that Larry had started to. So if we go to the next slide, it kind of describes the two programs we talked about. The first is the managed home sharing program. That's for our residents. Our residents can opt into this program. They don't have to participate. Um, they're also not allowed to home share on their own. They can't be their own host. Everyone who's moved into the building, we moved our first residents in in July of last year. We're a little over 80% occupancy, heading to 90% occupancy right now. All of those residents have already signed leases that prohibit them. They have an addendum that says you cannot short-term rental on your own. If you want to, you have to opt into our program, and we manage it. We run it for you. So it's very convenient for them. They tell us when they're going to leave town, and we do everything else. Take care of all the reservations, the bookings, the listings, check-ins, check-outs, cleanings. They don't have to lift a finger. We do it all professionally managed for them. Um, so it's an easy and safe way for them to make an extra little bit of money, a little bit of money as, uh, as uh, Larry was talking about. <clears throat> Excuse me. The guest suite program as we talk, is vacant units. We're clustering them on the eighth floor. There are 28 units that don't include our three bedroom units or one bed bedrooms and studios on the eighth floor, um, 28 units that we'd be seeking permits for initially. And then we'd open up later the managed home sharing program. We want to work out the kinks with the, the guest suite program first before we involve our residents. And uh, we're running out of time, so I'll stop right there. There you go. You have a minute and 45 seconds left for, for your rebuttal. So, thank you very much. Uh, anyone wishing to speak in favor? Come on up to the microphone. Come on up. You can just line up behind there, and we 
we did make an executive decision to get rid of the wipes that we didn't think they were working properly. So you don't have to wipe it down, but. Hi, good evening. My name is Mark East. I, uh, uh, I'm a resident at, at Connect, and I own Pop Rock Films. We're an independent movie production studio here in Nashville. Connect is our creative home. And in one location at Connect, we can create a script in the conference room. We can use the uh, building to film scenes. We can record soundtrack music in the studio. But for us, the one piece that's missing is a place to house cast and crew. And so the ability to short-term rent uh, apartments at Connect is extremely important to us and would be very attractive. Uh, Short-term rental of apartments at Connect would enable us to bring many more productions to Nashville because we could house the cast and crew on site. Uh, we would be able to hire more people, attract a higher level of talent if we were able to house them on site for short periods of time. Uh, we very much hope that you will help our business grow by approving this amazing new resource. Thank you. And, sir, did you do we get your name and address? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. So whenever you come up and speak, make sure you just say your name and address. Everyone gets two minutes. Come on up. Good evening. Uh, Jeffrey Rentner, 1815 Cajal Avenue, Nashville, Tennessee. I'm here because uh, I'm in favor of moving forward with this motion. Uh, as you know, on December uh, 25th this year, we held, had a devastating blast downtown. I work with Premier Parking. Our corporate office was uh, just in ruins due to, the, due to the attack that took place down there, and Connect was wonderful enough to open their doors to us and provide us an opportunity and a place for us to have a home and uh, continue to conduct business effectively here in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, they are about community. They, they, they offered us free rent for the first month that we were there um, and just didn't have been nothing but great partners throughout this time that was very difficult for us. Uh, I don't see any negative value that allowing them to move forward would do. This is going to do nothing but raise economy for my business and all surrounding businesses uh, around the Connect building. And I am in favor of the motion. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak in favor? I'll make sure we get everybody. All right. Seeing no one else, uh, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. If you could line up and then everybody gets two minutes, state your name and address, and try not to repeat yourselves. That way we can. Thank you. Come on up. My name is James Powers, and I'm a resident at 807 18th Avenue South. I'm president of the 807 Homeowners Association. My wife and I have been residents in this community for 13 years. Connect is across the alley from our building, and we oppose approval of short-term rentals for this property. There are simply too many short-term rentals in the Music Row vicinity, producing a tremendous increase in traffic congestion, noise, and trash littering of sidewalks and streets. Connect has also not been a good neighbor. Despite several meetings with managers over its two-year construction, we've had to repair damage to our building, siding, roof, parking lot gate, and yes, even flat tires due to falling construction debris. Additionally, our community endured many late night and early morning construction pours and the clanging of concrete pumping as well as continued sweeping of construction dust falling on our courtyard and walkways. We feel that permitting short-term rentals at this property will have a negative impact on quality of life of other residents in our area. Connect was granted a building permit with an obligation to provide housing to uh, working class residents. We ask if there's been any accountability for this obligation to promote equity in our community. They also plan to have a ghost truck to deliver food in the community that will be stationed somewhere near the alley. Our parking garage opens into this alley. It's already difficult on many days to drive into the alley and to turn out onto 19th Avenue due to trucks and other vehicles blocking us. Connect has not lived up to their other previous agreements when the original zoning was changed, such as bike line lanes. <clears throat> if this amendment is granted, it will be the largest short-term rental property in Midtown. Connect is not a hotel and should not be granted hotel privileges. 
Thank you. Thank you, sir. Welcome. I'm Martha Wedeman, and I also um, I'm a resident of 807 18th Avenue South, which is across the alley from Connect. And I asked the Planning Commission to oppose this application. Connect is not in compliance with their original permit on several counts. They were supposed to have a bike lane on 19th. They didn't set that up. They're supposed to have valet parking. They don't have that. They are also was supposed to uh, include affordable workforce housing. And they say their studios are their affordable housing. However, they plan to repurpose the studios so they will not be in compliance. Um, on this home share program, this would also involve the repurposing of studio apartments that were supposed to be affordable workforce housing. And they state they would sign year leases with students and then while they're away for the summer, use the studio apartments for short-term rentals. And there are several major problems with this scene, with this um, idea. Um, if they, and I've already pointed out the affordable workforce housing problem. And if what, what happens if the short-term renters trash the college students' apartments over the summer? Will these damages be charged to the students' deposit, or how will that be taken care of? And once the short-term rentals are approved, there's nothing stopping Connect from using them all year long for short-term rentals and just skipping the rent to Vandy students' part of the agreement. So this is a residential neighborhood, and... Um, Many students, including medical and law students, live in the neighborhood and need some quiet and steady time. There are also numerous young families other the bar, than the bars on Division Street. This is not really a party zone. Also, their, uh, their proposed STR home sharing and guest suite programs are in direct violation of Metro short-term rental property. Particularly, um, no food shall be prepared or served to the transient by the permit holder or manager. So Connect already holds a permit for a restaurant. Thank you. You can finish your thought and then just conclude. Thank you. Um, so Connect already holds a permit for a restaurant and takeout. So my husband went to an event there at which food was served by their chef. So when they were building Connect... Well, I was we, thinking a sentence, but... Okay. <laughs> we heard they were going to have a food court also. So I think that having food available to the transients is not Thank permitted. You. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Welcome. My name is Bruce Gallo. I live at 920th Avenue South, which is the Adelicia Condominium. As a procedural matter, I would like to request that I could speak for up to five minutes since I am the HOA president of the Adelicia Association. Is that permissible? Yeah, that, that's fine. Uh, you know, we, we try to be really lenient on that. Um, you know, just to let everybody know, you're supposed to file a letter beforehand to request that, but you don't always come down here and practice here. So, that's okay. We'll give you five minutes, I, to I'll, be fair. And I apologize for that, but I asked that specific question, and I was told no. So Okay. That, I'm it, sorry. That's I'm fine. You. We'll give you five minutes. Thank you, sir. Yep. Um, while I'm here today, technically speaking, on behalf of the Adelicia HOA and our 186 owners, 39 of which have submitted letters in opposition to this petition, I could just as easily be speaking for the thousands of residents in Midtown that would be affected by this change in zoning. I am quite confident that all of them, like us, could not find any benefit to the community resulting from the applicant's request. Rather, the matter before the Commission is purely a matter of financial self-interest on the part of Connect and Cura. As a matter on the issue of integrity and intent, Connect has, in our opinion, not been straightforward in its intent. Initially, Connect Zoning was approved as a multifamily unit residential building in 2017. Now, the Chicago-based developer seeks rezoning to 210 short-term rental units, which is a completely different direction than indicated in the original application. Whether this change request is based, at best, on a changed business model, or at worst, on a lack of integrity on the original petition, there is no benefit to the community that they can articulate. Secondly, there's an issue pertaining to the quality of life in Midtown. If allowed, Connect would be the largest STRP building in Nashville, with almost double the number of the 505 building downtown. That makes absolutely no sense either for Nashville as a city or Midtown as a neighborhood. The short-term rental market average length of stay is four days, and that creates a high transient user profile. Short-term rentals are well known to be vehicles and opportunities to attract crime, as has been evidenced in the Gulch and other neighborhoods. 
and short-term stays usually result in long-term negative impacts. Adding 210 short-term rental units with the additional hundreds of occupants per night that are likely to occur to the Midtown neighborhood will result in dramatic increases in unwanted activities, including increases in the illegal noise in the area and disturbances as transients see, seek to maximize their enjoyment experience of Nashville. Litter, loitering, illegal consumption of alcohol, as an example, uh, when you look at Division Street after a Monday night uh, whiskey jam concert or any weekend around the Division Street bars with broken glass, beer bottles, and litter filling the streets. And by their own admission, Connect Ankara does not have a well-defined method or standards in place for screening these transients pertaining to their backgrounds as potential threats to our community and its full-time residents. On the issue of traffic and mobility, 19th Avenue South from Grand to Broadway has been classified as a connector street in the Music Row Vision Plan. Designed to be a vital access to Division Street, Broadway, downtown and I-40, the 19th Avenue South connector is an already clogged thoroughfare of illegally parked cars, delivery trucks, parading pedal taverns, and transportainment vehicles, and illegally stopping, standing, and turning Ubers. And connects current social, work, gym, pool, membership club, the pictures of which you saw, a main feature of its business model already contributes to this condition. Clearly, permitting 210 short-term rentals at 19th Division will further choke mobility along the 19th Avenue South Connect Street, and allowing hundreds of short-trip overnight transients visit in Nashville as tourists will further overtax the 19th Avenue South and Division Street traffic corridors of the neighborhood. And all of this will contribute to the inability of emergency vehicles to navigate these important streets to service the community. Uh, I want to bring to your attention some possible violations of Metro Code that you should consider, please, as you're evaluating this petition. Number one, opposing Connect's application in this circumstance for short-term rentals supports, in our view, Metro Council's ban on new STRs in residential neighborhoods, which, as we understand it, is to be become, effect become effective in January of 2022, due to the demonstrated detrimental impact on several neighborhoods, as I have already spoken. Connect's proposed STR home sharing and guest suite programs appear to be in violation of Metro's short-term rental property operation rules and requirements, which state, as was previously mentioned by the, by the woman just before me, simultaneous rental to more than one party under separate contract shall not be allowed. No food shall be prepared or served to the transient by the permit holder or manager. Connect already holds a permit for a restaurant and a takeout. And Metro further defines a short-term rental as 24 hours to 30 days. Connect Ankara's proposed target market definition of corporate relocations and traveling nurses strains all credibility in that their true objective is to attract short-term tourists. More corporate relocation, most corporate relocations require far more than 30 days, and that is likely also true for traveling nurses. Permitting to final take, uh, I want to deliver, I want to relay a quote from Councilman O'Connell from a couple of years ago. My overall take on this, if you aren't, by zoning, allowed to operate a hotel, then we shouldn't be allowing you to have a non-owner-occupied short-term rental. Actual residents have made their voices heard very clear on this. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Perry Widener. I live at 920th 20, Avenue South, which is one block from the Connect Project, and I've lived in the neighborhood since 2017. Over that time, we've experienced dramatic growth, and it's both welcome and expected. However, it should be within the character of the community. It should be well managed, and it should be thoughtful. I'm here today to oppose the request by Connect to turn 210 rooms in their apartment building into short-term rentals, effectively turning this into a hotel. This massive STR is near Nashville's historic music row. It would be the largest in the city, and it would bring as many as 1,400 additional people to this crowded corridor every day. Nashville isn't the first city to encounter short-term rentals adjacent to historic neighborhoods. New York, Austin, Savannah, New Orleans, among many others, have had this issue. Experiences in these cities and statistics from recent scholarly studies show that 
Without exception, the character of neighborhoods is negatively impacted when SDRs move in. Crime, trash, traffic, parking issues, loitering, and noise all increase. Why is this? It's because the people who occupy STRs don't vote. They don't pay taxes. They don't send their children to local schools. They don't go to church here. They have no vested interest in keeping the neighborhood vibrant, clean, diverse, and safe. This application is in direct opposition to Metro Council's ban for new STRs in residential neighborhoods that takes effect in just 60 days. And it's being instituted due to the negative effects from STRs in the Gulch, 12 South, and WeHo. Further, the application's in direct opposition to Metro Zoning Code's title and purpose, which states, this title further establishes development standards which are designed to protect the value and integrity of neighboring properties, enhance the general character and appearance of the community. I'm almost, I have one more thought. The community character manual does not include short-term rentals as approved land use for a T5 MU such as Connect. For these reasons, I urge you to vote no on this application. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and, and let's try to stay within the two minutes. Yes, sir. Thank you. My name is Beth Shin. I live at 920th Avenue South, and I oppose the application. In addition to being a Nashville resident and a neighbor, I'm a member of the Mayor's Affordable Housing Task Force and the Homeless Planning Council. Nashville urgently needs ha housing, especially affordable housing. It doesn't need more short-term rentals. Even market rate housing contributes to Nashville's ability to house its poorer residents by removing competitors from the market and easing upward pressures on rents. Moreover, poor tenants can use housing choice vouchers to pay the fair market rent for market rate rentals if they can find them. Short term rentals, on the other hand, drive up rental costs for everyone. A Harvard Business Review article by Barron et al. estimates that the growth in short term rentals accounts for about one-fifth of the average annual increase in U.S. rents. Working on behalf of the Affordable Housing Task Force, Greg Claxton of the Planning Department calculated that Nashville needs an additional 44,772 rental units, renting to people below 80% of area median income by 2030. If we count people making up to $110,000 per year, we need nearly 50,000 units. Given this need, there should be a strong presumption against any zoning variance that permits conversion of housing to short-term rentals anywhere in Nashville, and especially in neighborhoods like Midtown with access to jobs and transit. Taking 210 units off the market in one fell swoop is a big step in the wrong direction. Our council member was quoted earlier as saying actual residents of Nashville have made their voices heard very clearly on this. Actual residents are speaking to you today. Nashville desperately needs rental housing. We don't need short-term rentals. Please vote against this proposal. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Andrew Smith, 920th Avenue South. Traffic in Midtown has been getting worse ever since I moved there 13 years ago. Several intersections are dysfunctional, including the one directly in front of Connect. There are several essentially failed signaled intersections, the ones that often take more than one cycle to cross. The addition of several new restaurants, bars, and retail spaces has added to that, as have the construction of buildings such as Connect and Morris. There's a lot of empty or under construction retail and restaurant space, so the problem will only get worse. Bar customers often park in our neighborhood since it's the nearest cheap or free parking the new Moore office building is right across the street from Connect, less than a block away from a large hotel, and several hundred apartments are nearing completion. Just past those is the new Vanderbilt graduate housing, which will bring 600 residents, as well as several other office buildings under construction. Multi-year road closures are also causing major problems. Um, I think we need to step back and see how all this additional traffic affects things before adding to the density in the neighborhood. Uh, I enjoy living in a vibrant urban neighborhood, but the infrastructure is getting stretched a bit too thin. Please vote to not approve this request. Thank you. 
Thank you. Come on up. Good evening. My name is Andrew Hyde. I live at 920th Avenue South. It's about 500 feet from the Connect building in discussion today. I'm here today to ask you to vote against the zoning amendment that Connect's developer car partners are requesting. I moved to Nashville 28 years ago, and I've had property in the area for about 20 years. I'm a committed Nashvilleian, and while I'm in favor of building out Midtown, I believe that development must follow a path set forward by the regulators, and any amendment should be awarded to entities. Oops, we <laughs> messed up. Let's go back to two minutes. And we, messed That's all right, no problem. we messed you up. Okay, go ahead. That's all right. I'm just going to say that any. I'm in favor of building out Midtown, but I feel that the development must follow the path set forward by regulators, and any amendment should be awarded to entities that add to, not detract from, the community and the neighborhood. This applicant has not been straightforward throughout the entire zoning process. First, from the beginning, short-term rentals were part of their business plan. Be very clear about that. Um, I remember reading about this on their, or actually hearing it in a video on their website back in 2019. Why didn't they include this 210 uh, unit short-term rental request in the original zoning application? No one knows. I assume perhaps it's because they knew it wouldn't pass them. And so maybe they thought they could get it past us now. Well, that's where we are now. Second, they haven't fulfilled their commitments of the original SP ordinance BL20017-976 passed by Metro Council in the third reading on December 19th, 2017. For example, they're supposed to have a flashing pedestrian light at um, Division Street and 19th. That doesn't exist yet. Um, in fact, one of our neighbors had to call and ask the uh, Metro uh, Traffic Department to put in a, a striping there and a sign. They didn't do that. Um, deliveries, Ubers, and UPS are supposed to be by, the, by this um, uh, the SP 2017-976 uh, agreed to by council, the deliveries and Ubers and UPS are supposed to be delivered inside the garage. They're not. They're being delivered in the street, blocking traffic. Um, they're supposed to consult, as mentioned earlier, with traffic council about the bike markings. That hasn't been done either. So if they didn't do what they said originally, and haven't done anything for the last four years, why would we reward them? Last, let me reiterate that 210 short-term rentals is essentially a mid-sized hotel. This would be the biggest in the city. The applicant will tell you that all these won't be used as short-term rentals at the same time, but I can tell you maybe that's true for this developer. What about the next one? The car is a developer. They buy and sell buildings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening, and thank you for having us, and thank you for your service. My name is Lisa Haller. I live at 920th Avenue South. I am here tonight to oppose Connect's request. First, I would like to thank Councilmember Freddie O'Connell, the planning staff, especially Logan Elliott, and the Connect leadership team for the productive dialogue and discussions that we have had together for the last several weeks. And welcome Councilmember Brett Withers. 14 years ago, my partner and I made the decision to move to Nashville and make Midtown our home. We are original owners in the Adelicia condominium building located a block from Connect, which you actually could see our building in many of those slides. I serve on the board of the Adelicia HOA, and I'm also the commissioner for District 19 for Metro's Beautification and Environment Commission. We chose Midtown for its historic character, walkability, proximity to downtown, its residential livability, public safety, open green space, and its long-term promise. Today, our beloved Music Row and Midtown neighborhood has experienced an exponential rise in crime, people robbed at gunpoint, vehicle break-ins, attempted assaults, traffic, trash, litter, construction detours, noise, broken beer bottles, and this is true, party goers openly urinating on the sidewalks, and a plethora of pedal taverns and transportainment vehicles on our residential streets. The very notion of permitting 210 short-term rentals at Connect with upwards of 1,200 to 1,400 travelers a night is irresponsible to the residents and businesses that strive every day to uphold the livelihood and the well-being of our community. We ask the commissioners to protect the public safety of the thousands of residents, homeowners, employees, faculty, students, songwriters, parents, grandparents, children, and newborns that live, work, and learn in Midtown. Almost done. And please do not be tempted by short-sighted, short-term investors. We urge you to not approve Connect's application. 
Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. And, and before you start, sir, hold on. if everybody would do me a favor, just try to put your phone on silent and that way it doesn't interrupt the speakers because it interrupts their thoughts. So if everybody do that, that would be awesome. Thank you. And that applies to commissioners too. I've put <laughs> mine on silent. All right. We're ready? Go ahead. Good afternoon. My name's uh, W.L. Gray. Uh, my wife and I live at uh, 920th Avenue South, which is at the Alicia, at Alicia. As you've heard from my friends from the Alicia and our neighborhood, we're concerned about the integrity and the safety of our slice of Midtown. In the beginning, Bruce shared with you a strategic brief on our position. Martha noted original conditions of the SP that are not being met by Connect. Jim shared concerns of shared alleys and more work office meeting spaces beyond permitted amounts. Perry cited crime statistics and livability. Beth discussed the affordable housing aspect of the Connect development. Drew discussed increased traffic congestion and the increase in urban density. Andy reviewed the history of the developers, and Lisa also discussed public safety and livability. So let me wrap it up. In my view, the developers of Connect are much like the Greeks. They created a Trojan horse by completing their development under one set of rules, which governed multifamily living, and now the development is in place, look to pivot to a short-term rental facility. The incontrovertible evidence was just cited by my friends. The Planning Commission is charged with establishing and governing rules for growth with integrity. We are not denying that there has to be enterprise value for the developers and owners. However, our view is that there does not need to be a transient turnstile in Midtown so that integrity and safety of the neighborhood can be maintained. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Saying none, rebuttal, two minutes. And then we'll, the council member, if I think Mr. O'Connell's still here. I think. Go ahead. Commissioner. Well, actually, you have a minute and 45 seconds. I right. forgot. Okay. Let's. <laughs> Commissioner. I want to be official here, or I'll get, what? we'll get sued, and then I'll be in trouble. And All right, go ahead. It's amazing how emotional things can get in a very technical uh, residential situation. STRPs are residential uses per the code, per the zoning code. Uh, they are not commercial, they are not hotel, they are residential. We anticipated, because we have had considerable discussions with not all of the people who came here tonight from the Adelicia, but many, what their opposition will be. I think if you distill it down, it's not with the Connect building. It is built substantially in accordance with a very strict SP, including the final SP. Yeah, there are a couple of things that aren't done yet, but the contractor is working on them, and those are conditions of approval tonight. Uh, some of you may know, I was one of the developers and legal counsel for the Adelicia. It is a great building. We're very proud of it. It's a wonderful place to live. I still own a commercial unit there, so I am very invested in this community with partners, but I'm the president of the entity that owns it. Uh, it, it STRP and connect are not responsible for all of the ills that visit dense, intense areas like Midtown. Uh, and for some reason, it's become a lightning rod. Even though the STRP use here is limited, it's controlled by these programs, and it's internal. It would not bring any material difference to life at the Adelicia Thank or you. the neighborhood. Thank you. Uh, is Councilman O'Connell here? Um, Councilman, if you want to speak, you can. If, if not, you've already spoken on this item, and we appreciate that. Okay. Just want to make sure we always, we work in tandem with the council all the time, and so we always try to respect council members and make sure that we, we hear them out. 
So seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. And Vice Chair, do you want to you want to go first? I'm just going to proactively look at you since you, I know you're coming this way. Um, <laughs> my head. I don't know. Go. So I totally relate to um, the congestion challenges and concerns with this whole area that I think a lot of the residents um, discussed tonight. I mean, I'm. As you know, I have kids at USN and I drive that street daily and Friday afternoons have become essentially a parking lot coming down division. Um, with all the additional construction underway, I, I fear things are only getting worse in that little area. Um, that said, I don't think that really impacts how I think about this specific project and, what's, and the possibility of the short-term rentals there. Um, but I do kind of need a short-term rental zoning refresher. Um, as, as much as we've talked about this over the years, can you remind me, I guess my first question is, if they had intended to have short-term rentals in the property when the SP was, in, was approved in 2017, what would we have done differently? And then the second piece to that question is, remind me where non-owner-occupied short-term rentals are allowed and if they sh would be allowed in this area today. Sure, so um, as you all know, there have been various and sundry uh, text amendments related to short-term rentals. So when this um, SP was passed um, and approved, short-term rental was at that time a specific use in the zoning code. Um, the way that SPs work um, is if you look at the land use table for SPs, it's blank. There are no uses marked as permitted or permitted with conditions or accessory. It's a blank slate because the uses that are permitted in SPs are the ones that are specifically designated for each SP. So for this SP, Logan went through the uses that were outlined as being permitted, and they included multifamily residential, which is, again, a specific listing in the zoning code, office, retail, restaurant, retail, specific lists, lists uses in the zoning code. Uh, for short-term rentals to have been permitted at the time that this SP was approved, it would have had to include that the permitted uses were 400 multifamily residential, 200 short-term rental, so it would have had to be listed in the, in the uses to be permitted. Um, and so the amendment is the necessary tool to add a use to an SP that was not otherwise specified. Now, since the time that the SP has passed, um, at that time, short-term rental was one use. Um, there have been various countywide um, changes, and when the, the latest countywide framework was adopted, they were split into two uses. Uh, Short-term rental owner-occupied, which is under the broader category of residential in the zoning code, and then short-term rental not owner-occupied, which are under the broader commercial category of the zoning code. And so those two uses were <coughs> split. Um, Owner-occupied generally are permitted in residential districts, um, and there are standards about where they are located or how they are located and operational standards that are in a different title of the code. Not owner-occupied are generally permitted in mixed-use districts and those sorts of things. But again, for SPs, they are permitted where explicitly listed because the uses of SPs are, are, are per SP. Does that help? So if it was to come today before us as a new project, we would say that this is an area where we allow not on owner occupied because it's a mixed use, but we would have still expected to see it listed in the use of the SP. So from a policy standpoint, our, our policies, um, the, the community character manual when we talk about policies, our policies are sort of silent on this particular use. Um, and again, the, the guidance and the policies and when they talk about uses, they don't use necessarily the exact language of our zoning code. There are hundreds of uses listed in the zoning code. But our policies will say things like industrial or 
non-residential, but will maybe not be as specific as, as the uses that are listed in our code. And so what, when we as staff were looking at it, um, we were generally saying, well, a hotel would likely be supported by this policy. And while they are not the same use, there are similar characteristics. Um, and so a hotel would be supported in say a mixed use policy. And so that's where we landed. Um, but short-term rentals aren't specifically sort of addressed in the policy. Okay, so we'd be having the same debate <laughs> if it was new. Okay. Um, so some of the other things that were brought up, um, I do remember the discussion about there would be no prepared food um, in the in the non owner occupied short term rentals. So how how would we reconcile that with what we were hearing today that there are our restaurant there's a restaurant on site. So restaurant is a permitted use within the SP. Um, a restaurant was permitted um, as one of the uses in the SP. Now, the operational standards related to short-term rentals are in a different title. Those are in Title VI. Um, they were removed from Title 17 in one of the changes to the code. And so if there was a violation of Title VI, that would be a code's sort of property standards violation um, it would not be regulated by the zoning. So the zoning is merely looking at the use, but all of those up other operational standards, such as uh, occupancy limits and all of those things are, are on Title VI. Thank you. That's kind of what I was thinking. I just needed to refresh my memory on all of this. Um, I guess one, the last question is, um, and again, this is kind of a new situation, but as we have thought about concentrations of non-owner-occupied short-term rentals, have we ever talked about a threshold or a, a, a limit? I mean, 50% of the units being non-owner-occupied short-term rental does, you know, and a 420-unit building is is a lot. Um, has that ever? Has that something we've discussed at all? A standard for that? No, I mean, in the various changes that have taken place throughout the, when short-term rentals were first being regulated, there were um, percentages by census tract, um, and again, they've sort of evolved. But the thinking on, the thinking on generally, take sort of the SP out of it, the thinking generally on not owner-occupied is that they are permitted in the same sort of zoning districts where hotels are permitted. Um, and so, but SPs, again, are, are sort of different animals because the uses are contextual and uh, that's why we would use SPs um, to, to sort of take in context and those sorts of things. And so it's a little bit different. Commissioner, one of the policy gaps that I think we're, you know, unearthing and working through here is that we do have uh, a housing need in the city. Um, we are bringing on housing specialists at the planning department and are in the process of hiring those who will help us better define that need. You heard from a member of the Affordable Housing Task Force, 44,000 units is what we need to produce. We've got to put a finer grain set of um, sort of analysis on that to help us better understand where, where, where units need to be located, how we balance those with uses such as non-owner occupied STR. So I see this as, as something citywide that we do need to tackle so that we as staff can better advise you. I think you're, you're perceiving here that gap. We see it, we know we need to tackle it. I don't think it's fair to ask one, one property to overcome that, but I do think what you're identifying is a broader question mm -hmm. And I do think, I'm not suggesting we would look at thresholds for non-owner occupied STRs in that work, but I do think it will help us fill out that broader framework that we need to accomplish. And I think that will help us when we review SPs and we have that discretion, you'll have an additional piece of information to say, okay, on balance, we're striking the right tone here. So that work is coming and I, I understand how important it is. No, I mean, that's, 
that was my next issue was the workforce housing questions. And, and I think you've kind of addressed that, but um, I mean, I do, I certainly recognize, you know, we talk a lot about setting a precedent. There is such a high volume of multifamily units in this, in this area, very concentrated. And I don't remember how many of those have non-owner non occupied specified as a use, mm -hmm. but I could see the potential for, you know, a big transition of units mm -hmm. to non-owner occupied short-term rentals. Um, and that's, I'm gonna listen to what everyone else has to say, but that's just something that um, raises a concern. And as our new council representative, um, you know, maybe this question about how much, you know, what percentage of, of these big buildings overall can be non-owner occupied is something we need to think about. But I'm going to listen to everybody else. Commissioner Tibbs. Um, and I may have missed it, Logan, but um, the original I concept where these were going to be just rented apartments, so that was the original uh, concept for it. Is that what, um, and you may have said it, but I just could you repeat that part? The SP originally was approved for 420 multifamily units, and that was uh, essentially the only use permitted for those units. Yeah, okay. I, I thought so, but I didn't want to speak incorrectly. Um, so, um, you know, I do in general like getting the, um, the, you know, getting these out of the neighborhoods, you know, because they can be so uh, disruptive to communities, you know, when this happens and, you know, people that are, you know, spending the night. So anyway, I, I do like it in some ways being put into these more dense areas. So in, in that aspect, <clears throat> I could be in favor of it. But, um, you know, just like a lot of the res well, there's two things. One, there are, there are residents right next to it, and um, they're multifamily, and um, this is kind of a changing after the fact, you know, and I, um, you know, maybe... Yeah, I understood that there was different um, ways to go about it back when they were um, building originally, but um, you know, kind of the with the housing shortage, we do know that um, STRPs don't really um, help that as much. So it it does seem like it's going counter uh, productive, or I guess counterintuitive, whatever is different direction than um, you know at least the original concept was. There is also, I think, in Midtown, you know, uh, uh, still a need for more, you know, um, housing, um, um, alt you know, choices. <clears throat> so I, I, I may have been more, um, um, what's, you know, positive toward it when it first came through than I think I am now. Um, it, I feel like now it's kind of like um, kind of going backwards. And I don't know if it's just a you know, financial decision or what, but uh, I but I don't want to say I, I'm for, you know, getting these out of the community. I'm okay with that. It seems, it does seem like it's like right near a hotel. You know, it's, it, it, it does get to be that comp competition with that as well. I, I'm a little teeter-tottering either way, but a little bit more toward, um, you know, denying the um, amendment to the SP for that reason. Um, especially, you know, just, you know, not just listening with the neighbors, but just kind of the, the change of it. However, I'll, I'll still listen to the rest of my um, commissioners to see if uh, there's more information that maybe I didn't think about. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think Commissioner Tibbs uh, touched on it. Uh, I, too, am bothered by the timing because since this is a SP, and you know we have been talking about short-term rentals since uh, prior to 2015. You know since 20, 2008, and then finally, you know, codified. And then by the time you know uh, Council Member Withers and I become the Council Member 2015, we had to kind of amend so many times to make it right to you know coexist short-term rental business as well as residential. So we had, you know, go through lots of amendment. So, you know, if this uh, multifamily residential unit uh, development with restaurant and sales office and lease office component were intent to introduce short-term rental, 
you know, back then, 2017, they could have done that. But, you know, after they open, start uh, leasing, leasing the apartment, I understand right now it's 80% uh, you know, occupancy. So now they're asking to amend short-term rental. Yeah, that timing is a little bit concerning to me. But aside that, this is a T5 center mixed-use neighborhood. So it's, you know, residential zoning with lots of mixed use. So to me, it is like a restaurant, you know, office. Yes, hotel is, of course, one of those. But accommodate residential and, you know, larger view, we are definitely, definitely need of more units. So half of the, you know, already developed unit converting to, you know, not owner-occupied short-term rental is a commercial use. So I think it's not, uh, you know, uh, our overall, you know, reach or it does not meet our overall goal. So for that reason alone, you know, I am uh, totally against this amendment because we should, uh, you know, find more way to especially affordable housing unit. So I understand, you know, the owners want, but... I think it's not meet our overall goal. So for that reason, I'm not in favor of um, this amendment. Thank you, Councilman Withers. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to my colleagues for uh, speaking before me and giving me some things to think about, and uh, I'll, I'll try to do the same. Um, Councilmember Johnson is correct uh, in the... Uh, the council term that ended in 2015, uh, right at the end of that term, short-term rentals had been added to the zoning code initially, and um, we spent many a long nights, as did the planning commission, uh, over the term that ended 2019, um, trying to, uh, in some ways, put the genie back in the bottle uh, about that, because it, it got away from everyone very quickly, I think. Um, and that um, th there are still a lot of things about short-term rentals that uh, are... I think still need to be defined and we will continue working on, although it's a little bit less contentious than it used to be overall. I did want to respond to a couple of things that I think I heard from neighbors. And one was, uh, I think neighbors are referencing, um, uh, in the council I passed a bill that in REM or multifamily residential zoning, we do have short-term rentals expiring at the end of this year, but that is not what this zoning is. And it's also not what this, uh, it's not what this SP zoning is exactly. Um, and also, uh, as some of my colleagues have mentioned, from a community standpoint, point, uh, standpoint this is a mixed-use community plan and not a residential-only community plan policy that sits underneath this parcel. Um, and so some of those concerns, I think, are very valid. It's just that they don't fit quite with this particular zoning tool that's in place today, potentially to, to be amended, or with the community plan, because the community plan does call for pretty intense mixed uses here. From a uh, mobility standpoint, this is located along uh, a corridor. And so it uh, sometimes higher uh, trip rates are, are more appropriate here than they would be maybe deeper into the neighborhood. Um, one thing that I, I have struggled to understand, and, and I am still hoping to learn, and I don't know that we'll solve that today, but is uh, how exactly do STRs in something that's built as a residential unit, how do those differ, differ from a hotel from the standpoint of uh, do they have to register for an STR permit? And if so, do they have to follow the STR permit requirements, or is it like a hotel room, because the, those requirements are different. The way the buildings are built in terms of sprinkler requirements and ADA requirements a lot of times are very, very different uh, in a hotel than they would be in a, a building of condos that ends up being converted to STRs. There's just a lot of things like that that just we don't really have a good apples to apples comparison uh, in terms of how the buildings are done. And just want to throw that out there that there, there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, we also have a, a from a neighborhood perspective uh, and from definitely from a codes department perspective, uh, there's a great deal of difficulty that we have legally uh, um, 
defining what owner occupied is in terms of does this person live there or not. That is something that uh, the codes department really struggles to prove that someone does, does not live somewhere. And so we end up sometimes having something that would be approved as an owner occupied permit that behaves exactly like you would think a non owner occupied would. We uh, as a city don't have a cap on the number of dates when a unit can be rented out. And so you can sometimes have an owner occupied permit that is still rented out 365 days a year. And so, you know, again, from these neighbors, there's just a lot of things like that that we just haven't really worked out yet. For this one in particular, I think because it does have a mixed use community plan that, that the, I, I believe that this use does fit the community plan from a policy perspective in terms of the community character manual, I do think that that's the case. Um, and so that makes it uh, a little bit difficult to uh, recommend disapproval. Um, I definitely agree with my commissioner colleagues so far and, and those to come that we do have a housing crisis and removing uh, a significant number of units from that housing inventory, even at market rate, does have an effect. However, uh, we, as Director Kempf noted, we don't yet have really a policy on what our housing needs are and we don't have a benchmark that says how many multifamily units do we have, how many SDRs do we have, and, and what do we do with that data. I just don't know if we have a good policy uh, in place to fall back on to, to really weigh this particular question. Um, I, I have a lot of empathy for the neighbors. I think that the business plan actually is pretty intriguing uh, from the standpoint that it sounds like a lot of the units actually would be sort of run as an owner-occupied unit. Someone would live there for the most part, then, then when they're gone, there would be professional management. Um, and so uh, that is uh, a good thing. However, one of my concerns as well is that the leases, I think, are really good. The business model is really good. But I don't see a lot of that that is codified in the SP, per se. And so I think the, part of the appeal of that to, to us as a commission is to say we have good safeguards in place. And I think you do. But those aren't necessarily codified in this SP. And so what we end up doing if we approve this SP or recommend approval is we say this many number of units can be an SP and y'all could be a great operator or not, but the planning commission and probably the Metro Council can't really control that if it's not written into the SP somehow. So those are the things that I, I think I'm kind of struggling with a little bit on both sides of this. I think it's a really interesting case. Um, I think from the community plan standpoint, this does meet the community plan, um, but, uh, but there definitely are a lot of other concerns to be ironed out. Um, I think regardless, I think even if the commission does vote to recommend approval of this with conditions, I think that Council Member O'Connell will, will want to continue his conversations with the property owner and the applicant um, so to, to get us to maybe a more refined SP at some point. But, but those are my thoughts, and I look forward to hearing from the other commissioners. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Commissioner Haynes. Um, my commissioners have articulated this very well. I do think we have a housing crisis. I don't think we have a short-term accommodation or hotel crisis. Uh, I think if we approve this tonight, we're going to have a slippery slope as a body to have other multifamily projects come before us and have to deal with this in the same manner. Uh, part of living in a multifamily apartment building and in a neighborhood is to build community with your neighbors. You can't do that with short-term guests. I think if we approve this while I applaud Connect's safeguards, there's no guarantee that a car doesn't sell this project and we have no control over the future owners. So for those reasons, I am going to oppose staff's recommendation. Chairman Lawson. Well, <clears throat> Chairman, you need to turn your microphone on. Yes, sir. Do I have a few? You, you, um, <laughs> you don't have to, but we should. Uh, this, you know, this is one of the balancing acts between uh, the gray areas of policy and, and actual rigs in and of itself. Um, and listening to my fellow commissioners, they've made strong points. I think that uh, this is something that uh, should not be approved. It's time for a motion, Mr. Chairman, Chairman, or we'll Vice Chair. Disapprove. All right, that's a pro proper motion. Is the move to disapprove, and there's been a second. Any second. discussion? <coughs> Commissioner Johnson, did you want to? You nope. Okay. We got a 
A motion, a second. Any di we're on discussion. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all in favor of the disapproval, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and it's disapproved. We, so I think we might be able to um, resolve a couple of other cases. So the, um, the first one's going to be a little bit different because we always, um, commissioners, you know that I always err on the side of caution. And so we, on item 21, we included it uh, on the consent agenda, um, but we had some, some citizens come up to, to the team and say that they didn't hear it or there was some confusion and they didn't raise their hand to object. And so um, that's kind of a new process for us, to be honest. Um, after COVID, that's how we're doing uh, the process. And so I'm going to ask Lucy to kind of explain the situation and where we are on item 21 and then uh, potentially we, we make another motion. So, uh, Director, could you explain the situation? So, item 21 is 2021Z-012TX. Uh, Councilman O'Connell is the sponsor. And just so everyone can hear, this pertains to amending parking requirements and short-term rentals. And as the chair mentioned, we had it on consent and voted that way, given that we've received some comments from the public that they, uh, there was some confusion there and they would like to uh, offer input. It's the advice of council that we go ahead and hear the case. However, um, because we moved forward, it's possible that there were people who were here to speak in support who have left. And so in the um, interest of ensuring that we hold a fair uh, and transparent hearing, we uh, have sought an agreement from the council member, and I really appreciate his support in this, to defer that for one meeting so that, and we'll re-advertise so that everybody knows that they can come back and give input on that. And, and, and uh, our attorney believes that that's the very best way to, to proceed. So, Chair, if you are in agreement, we would need a motion to defer for one meeting yeah, and so procedurally, here's the situation, I believe, and the council, uh, our council will help us, but we'll need a motion to first reconsider our action on item 21 and vote on that first to bring it off the consent agenda and reconsider it, and then we'll make a motion, if the commissioners want to, to, um, we'll, we'll do separate, uh, that way we it's clear, um, and then we'll make a motion to defer and we'll go through our process if there's any questions or discussions. So the first motion after that explanation, is there a motion to take this out of order and reconsider our action on item 21? There's a second. There's a motion and a second to do that. Um, all in favor, uh, aye. any other discussion? Aye. Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no, ayes have it. We're reconsidering our action on item 21 to take it off consent and to place it for a one meeting deferral. Is that right, Lucy, or two? Yes, it is, one, one meeting, meeting deferral. For a one meeting deferral. So we'll need a motion for a one meeting deferral. <laughs> is there a motion? Vice Chair, you want to make the motion? Okay. So the Vice Chair makes the motion, seconded by sure. uh, Chairman Lawson. Any discussion to put it back to defer for one meeting, item 21? Seeing no other discussion, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Eyes have it. And thank you, Council Member, for allowing us to do that. We appreciate that. I'm not quite done, Chairman. I have one more item. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> item 31. Yes. This is 2021Z-110PR. Um, this is a request to rezone from RS20 and R10 to RS40 and RS80. That item was scheduled to be heard tonight, but it is my understanding that the issues have been resolved. And so as is your current practice, perhaps to confirm that there's no one in opposition and to anymore on this item and to see if the commission wishes to entertain um, placing that item on consent. Thank you, Director. And so in disposing of these items, we'll take this without objection. We'll take item 31 out of order. Is there an objection? Seeing no objection make sure all right so is anyone in the audience here on item 31 that objects to not to not 
putting it on the consent agenda, back on the consent agenda. I don't see, any, just to be clear, we want to go slow. All right, so is there a motion to put item 31 back on the consent agenda? Second. There's a motion and second. Any discussion from the commissioners? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no, ayes have it. And item 31 is back, is approved and put back on the consent agenda. Thank you for allowing us to do those housekeeping, more than housekeeping items to resolve those issues. So now uh, we are on to, so we have two items left. Uh, and I believe those items are item 18 and 26, correct, please? Okay, so we only have two items. And we are now on to item 18. Hey, so before we start the presentation, and we haven't opened the public hearing, I know you guys have, have been here sitting, waiting patiently. Um, we've been here two hours now, and usually the human body um, doesn't last that long before a restroom break. And so I hope, I hope it's okay if we take about a 10 minute break just so that we can um, I'll use the restroom and take a break. And uh, I don't, is, if, if the commission nurse are okay with that, uh, we just, I need to make sure that we all <laughs> can get, because it's going to be a long hearing on the next one. So is that okay? Without objection, we'll take a, a break. Letting us, I think everybody need a, a quick break. Um, before we get started, like I said, so a couple of ground rules that I always try to, we, look, this is a professional setting, professional meeting. I want to hear you. You guys want to hear us. It's not a protest, right? We want to get proper record. And so let's try to keep it professional. Uh, I'll try to remind you. And we, we need to conduct business as as our rules state. So I appreciate that, appreciate your patience. Um, and we're here to listen. We want to listen to both sides. And that's what we do. We try to take everything very, very seriously. The commissioners, as a reminder, we're all volunteers. Um, and so just we're citizens just like you. We want to hear the facts. So appreciate y'all. Um, and so let's go ahead and get started. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Seth Harrison with the Planning Department, and I'll be presenting item number 18. This case was originally presented, and a public hearing was held at the September 23rd Planning Commission meeting, where it was deferred to allow the applicant to speak with the property owners, and the public hearing remains open. Uh, at the October 14th Planning Commission meeting, this item was deferred once again. This request is to rezone from AR2A to R80. The zoning affects approximately 42.3%. Two four acres on McCrory Lane. The staff recommendation is to approve. Currently, the surrounding zoning consists of AR2A, R10 with a PUD, and an SP to the north. Uses include office space, park, and a potential townhome development. The policy for this site is T2 Rural Maintenance and Conservation. Although T2 Rural Maintenance lists agricultural-based zoning as appropriate, other districts may be appropriate as long as the desired zoning can be shown to, as consistent with the policy. The area highlighted in red located on the east, is located on the east side of Mercury Rain, south of Charlotte Pike and north of I-40. When determining whether a zoning district would be consistent with T2 Rural Maintenance, size of the lot, existing environmental conditions, desired density, and character of, of surrounding area are utilized. The existing lot is large and includes slopes of greater than 20%, a filled quarry, and a floodway as environmental constraints. R80, while not exactly two units per acre, is only a slight increase in density and allows for the same type of residential uses as AR2A. When looking at the surrounding area of office uses and potential six unit per acre residential development, a slightly more intense residential based zoning like R80 would be more appropriate than AR2A. With the size of the lot, existing environmental constraints, 
uh, and proposed zoning, staff finds the request to be consistent with the T2 rural maintenance policy and recommends approval. Thank you. And so we'll go ahead and open this item for public hearing. And just to explain to the commissioners and the public kind of our our process on this, this type of case, the applic it's a little bit different than a normal zoning request. So just let's go through this like we did last time. The applicant is actually the council member. Uh, we give council members unlimited amount of time to speak. Then the property owner on these types of cases, it, it's like the defendant. So we give them Traditionally, we've given them 10 minutes to speak to defend what, what, what that uh, rezoning looks like. Uh, and then we go into anyone wishing to support and then anyone wishing to speak in opposition. And then um, the owners will have a rebuttal and then the council member will go last. And so just want to remind everybody kind of the process of how we do these. These are a little bit different when the council member uh, requests a, a zone change. So. That's gonna be the, the process uh, for this particular case. So applicant is the council member, Councilman Rosenberg, come on up, welcome. Thank you, good evening y'all. Um, appreciate the opportunity to speak and um, as you hear a little bit more on this matter, uh, first, I'd like to point you to a packet you should have that includes some documentation of some of the legislation that we discussed last time and that you'll no doubt be hearing about again tonight. When we last got together, some of you expressed a desire for a meeting between the property owner and me, and that took place last week. We met for a little more than an hour. There was some heated conversation for certain and also an airing of concerns. Ultimately, the fact is that the property owner wants to run 200,000 dump trucks next to our community with no local rules or regulations to answer to in violation of the agreement that brought them great wealth and the community wants them to abide by their prior agreement. They didn't express any openness to any alternative and that brings us back to you today to ask you to enforce the prior actions of the Metropolitan Planning Commission and the Metropolitan Council who both declared emphatically that Hutton Lake, the former quarry, should not be filled by any offsite material of any kind. We are not asking you to impose any additional restrictions on the property owner that do not exist today. We are simply asking you to preserve the protections that exist now for the health and safety of our neighborhoods by supporting this application. Based on Nashville's general plan, this property is best used for large lot residential development. Homes on large lots would be in high demand, very profitable and harmonious with the community surrounding it. Having the lake as an amenity would only increase the market value of the homes that could be built on that parcel. Thank you. I look forward to hearing from members of our community. Um, I really appreciate everybody, appreciate everybody staying around, uh, coming down here to speak tonight, encourage everybody to speak their minds. Um, and if all you wanna say is, I agree with everyone else, that's all you've gotta do. Uh, thank you very much. I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you, Councilman, appreciate that. And then we'll have the, uh, uh, Representative Mitchell, we'll, hold on one second. Uh, it's the uh, owner's turn and then we'll get to the, uh, the own, is the owner of the land in the, come on up. And you have 10 minutes and you can save two of the 10 minutes for rebuttal. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, first of all, uh, we did have a meeting uh, with uh, Councilman Rosenberg we brought up all of the issues that were brought up in the last planning commission meeting and we offered to mitigate every single one of those and he came back with zero. Uh, he claims falsely that we've already made tons of money on this. I'd like to know where it is. Uh, we, we haven't made any money at all on this property. We bought the property before we subdivided the property. We sold half of it for more than we paid for the entire piece and then a youngster died in that quarry. We were sued and spent all of the money that we had made off the one half defending a lawsuit. It's very, very sad. And we have spent, since, since 2010, we, we have spent a, major, a lot of our time trying to figure out what can we do with this property so that that doesn't happen again. Nashville is gonna grow west. And as it grows west, the population out there will get bigger. And for those of you all, when you, when you read the news in a few years that somebody else died in the quarry, just recognize that, that we did everything, that we're trying to do what we can to stop that. 
Now, uh, let me say a few things, if I could, though, about the meeting. Uh, as we, as we discuss, discussed with the councilman, since 2010, we've done everything in our power to chase drunks and druggies from coming into the quarry virtually every sunny day from May to September. This includes signing a document every year with the Metro Police giving them permission to remove trespassers. A scuba diver instructor has been given the authority to tell people to leave and if not, to call the police uh, when, the, when they refuse to leave, which they always do. We put cameras on the property and they are viewed in real time by D2 Construction and their employees who are right next door. They call the police. The police show up occasionally. Police are busy. They've got lots of other things to do than to chase drunks and druggies off of a, a piece of private property. Um, we've explained the great risk earlier that the, that, the, uh, that the quarry presents. We reviewed our agreement with TDEC, with the, with the councilman, and pointed out that it allows for only clean rock and dirt to be put in the quarry pit. We offered to make it even clearer in writing if the councilman thinks there's any ambiguity with that document. We pointed out that if we don't put clean rock and dirt in there, we can go to jail. This is a serious matter. We view it that way. We reviewed the concerns raised by the people who live across the river at the last planning commission. Those things are, namely the number of trucks, possible lines of trucks on McCroy Lane, the possibility of mud on the roads, the hours of operations. Here's what we offered. We offered to restrict the average number of trucks to six, hour, six an hour. We think that'll be three coming from I-40 and three coming per seven, from 70. That'll increase traffic in the area by one half of 1%. Um, we, uh, hold on just a second here. A D2 construction uh, is, will be our operator. We'll only operate with three or four excavators. We are not in a hurry to fill the quarry. We want to do it right, and we want to do it in an engineered way, and we want the result to be able to pass a phase one environmental. Our, the value in the property ultimately for us is in having a 38 acre or 40 acres, whatever it is, flat piece of property that serves the community, which by 12 years from now will be a highly populated area. Um, we offered to, uh, uh, to, uh, that we would pay penalties if trucks lined up on McCroy Lane. Uh, we do this because we already know that we can put 20 trucks in line on our own property. Since we're only going to do six an hour, this is not an issue. So anyone who says it is, is just simply misinformed. Uh, we offered to buy tire cleaning equipment so that if there's any loose mud on the tires, we'll clean it off. We don't think there will be because our property is limestone. So it's not like they're going to be driving through mud. They'll be driving on limestone. We offered to open and close the quarry 30 minutes before uh, to open it after sunrise, 30 minutes after sunrise, and close it 30 minutes before sunset. There are claims that we're going to operate it 24-7. Those claims are false. We've never intended to do that. And we don't want to operate on Sunday. D2 construction is not in business on Sundays. Councilman Rosenberg brought up restrictions that he claims were agreed to when we were seeking zoning on the adjacent piece of property 15 years ago. Our council at the time explained after the fact, and our current council believes, that in addition to the ambiguity of the language of this restriction, that the adding of the restriction on a second piece of property uh, at the third reading was inappropriate and not binding. Both Towns, Duncan, and I stipulate that we were not contacted and did not know of these discussions and that we only learned about them sometimes later. Lastly, we, made, we want to make clear uh, that our, op to opposition, our opposition to Councilman Roseburg's rezoning of our property. We pointed out that given the geology and lack of sewer, that his plan is, makes our property valueless. And I really mean that. It is zero. We have checked. We have checked with experts. Ask the other people who testify. Ask the councilman. Has he checked with an expert to figure out how you can put, put single-family homes on limestone where there is no sewer. It doesn't perk. We remain adamantly opposed to dis down zoning, and we want to make it very clear. We believe that what he is doing constitutes a taking, and we'll take appropriate action if the, if the council passes this. This is just wrong. 
This quarry is a, is, an, is a quarry that is a public nuisance. It is not a lake. Anybody who says they come on it and enjoy it is admitting to you that they are trespassing. They have no right to do that. It's an it's a ugly piece of property that needs to, be, needs to have rock and dirt put back in it so that, it, so that somebody else doesn't fall in it or drown or something later. Uh, I'll stop now and hold a few minutes for rebuttal. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll reserve two minutes for rebuttal. So here's the situation. Anyone wanting to speak in support of the rezoning, come on up. Council, I mean, Representative, you want to go first? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Commission. I appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. Let me give you a quick little history of this. I've been fighting this since 2005. I've spoken at the Solid Waste Board. I've been to the Planning Commission. Uh, as a councilman, I, I stopped this landfill. And now in the Tennessee General Assembly, they're trying to go around Metro government and put this landfill in. You know, in 2005, they tried to send the landfill. They passed the Solid Waste Board. But thank goodness we found the Tennessee Scenic Rivers Act and a very wise state senator from Goodlettsville and a state representative from uh, Jolton stopped that. So we were able to stop that. So then before I became the councilman in 2007, they agreed to zoning if, if the community would agree to their townhomes and allow them to build the townhomes, they would secure the property and put a fence around the perimeter of the property, i.e. no one would have died if they would have done what they agreed to in the first place. But they failed in their responsibility, so I'm sorry they lost their profits. You know, I, I can't help they did not live to, up to their end of the bargain. This is kind of like the previous, previous uh, discussion you had, previous applicant. They want to change the rules mid-game. They, they have their piece of property, and now they want to do something else with it after this metro government has allowed them to do something with it. You know, I've, I've dealt with an illegal rock crushing operation by the people they say are going to, you know, oversee this that I'm supposed to trust. You know, for many years during my years on the council, I had to fight that illegal rock crushing operation around this quarry on their property. So it just continues. This is, you know, in the legislature bills that won't go away, we call a zombie bill. Well, this near Halloween is the zombie landfill. It keeps coming back over and over and over. And the community doesn't deserve this. You know, we've given them an opportunity to make more money off of their property than they've already made. He doubled, like he said, he more than doubled his, his profits from selling a small portion of the property by selling a very small portion. So the community is just tired. We are tired of the same fight over and over and over again. This started in August of 2005, and they're back again. You know, they left it alone for the years while I was in the council, but they had their rock crushing operation. Now they want tipping fees and 200,000 dump truck loads. They don't want to fill this in. The money's in the tipping fees. This is a glorified landfill. That's all it is. And I ask you to please save this community and stop this and let them know this is their last option. And, you know, again, they didn't do what they were supposed to and secure, secure the, uh, the property in the first place. Thank you all. Thank you, Representative. Anyone else? I know there's a lot of you. Come on up. And everyone gets two minutes. Please state your name and address. And that was and that was Representative Bo Mitchell. I didn't know if he had said his name. Thank you, Representative. Appreciate it. Go ahead. <laughs> My name is Patrick Belton, and I live at 7721 Daniel Trace. Um, so while we listened to the meeting on the 23rd, I took note of some important themes that the commission brought up. Trust and community involvement. You spoke highly of the trust in Councilwoman Van Reese that while she didn't have everything fully ironed out, you knew you could trust her to see it through and you granted her the rezoning. Then when it came to Councilwoman Setfula, you applauded her community outreach, the amount of time she had reached out through multiple channels. That's what you all were looking for when granting a rezoning. 
Now, while I agree that council member could have done more to engage the property owner prior to the last meeting, he has engaged our community to inform us and he has won our trust in doing so. The property owners though have decided to go around the normal avenues, declining any community involvement and dissolving all trust they could have built with us. Instead, they had two legislators from far east Tennessee file a bill to nullify their previous agreements. That bill allows the quarry owners exemptions from quote, all local restrictions, rules, regulations, municipal ordinances, and county resolutions if they fill with debris from quote, state highway construction projects, end quote. How will this be monitored to ensure it complies with this? What happens if they break that exemption rule? There seems to be no recompense listed and the wording of this legislation does not outline any guardrails to protect not only the safety of the Harpeth River, but also its citizens. I don't believe you are setting a precedent here by rezoning against the will of the property owner when nothing about this case is standard. I hope you all have had time to visit this site and maybe take a hike through Hidden Lake across the street and think on how this decision will figuratively and literally reverberate through those trees for years to come. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening and thank you for your service and the opportunity to speak before you this evening. I reside at 8025 Boone Trace. My name is Matthew Keller, but I'm better known in my community as Captain Sunshine of Sunshine's Adventures LLC, and I'm a proud resident of Bellevue in hopes to shine some light on this proposal. Before addressing any personal or professional issues pertaining to this uh, proposal, I must firstly notate the disrespect of such a proposal anywhere near a location where our fallen heroes hold their final resting place. As a son of two veterans born on base and raised in the military, I find it shameful that this proposal is even considered and that the fallen men and women who gave their lives defending the freedom and opportunity of the McCrory Lane partners have to own this property must be defended and protected against this proposal. As one of the closest residents within only 200 yards of the Hutton Quarry, having only the Harpeth River separating my property from the quarry, I must express my deepest concern for anything but preservation of this historical and biologically important piece of property. The effects of this potential uh, intentions for this property are monumental for everyone and everything involved, including local residents, human and otherwise, that surround this property. Even if this proposal were to commence, nothing can be built on top of it for years as the filling would need to settle before ever considering construction. And then, even after that time period has lapsed, the potential hazards of erosion, sinkholes, leaching into our water supply, and more are very real issues needing to be noted. The Hutton Quarry is not a useless hole full of water needing to be drained and filled for more development. It's a historic landmark that is evidence of our, his, of our city's earliest development, a statue for us all to be reminded of what it took to create our city. Its potential to be a blessing for our community rather than a burden is vacuous. I often bear witness during my guided tours and Harpeth River cleanups that residents wish to preserve this property as a place of recreational bliss. My trained and certified team and I would love the opportunity to provide an omni-mutual beneficial plan that allow the McCrory Lane partners to continue to maintain their ownership of the property without the extension of efforts and obligations or fear of being responsible for another unfortunate drowning. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, everyone. Diane Smith, 1062 River Spring. We are the green corner of Nashville. We rely on our parks, we rely on our green area. I know we need housing. I know we've talked about townhouses. I know we've talked about the different zoning. But this is a beautiful piece of property that when it's filled in is going to impact the Harpeth River, which is going to have huge impacts farther than just Bellevue. How it gets filled in is going to be a nightmare because as the property owner suggested, he's turning the responsibility to other people. He's not managing it. He's asking the construction company. He's asking you know, whoever else to demand trespassing or whatever. If it goes to the proper zoning and larger lots, the homeowners will have responsibility to more. There won't be an issue because you won't be going through individual homes to get to this property anymore. I'm asking that you grant the zoning requested to protect this beautiful area, to keep our corner greener, still allow for homes that I know we need, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Come on up, welcome. Thank you. My name is Yancey Wade. Uh, I live in Boone Trace. I just wanna point out some facts, uh, just some basic mathematical facts. 
within just a few hundred yards of this proposed very sizable project, there are thousands of homes and families. And Macquarie Lane is a two-lane road. And so this gentleman here is proposing his trucks, very sizable trucks to carry all this rock that he's proposing, driving up and down these two lane, two fairly narrow lanes where I drive every day, my wife drives every day. And I just did some basic math based on what he said on how many trucks he was proposing per day, that comes to about 50, 60 loads a day. And if it takes 192,000 trips, this is going to be a 10-year project where you're going to see massive trucks driving up and down Macquarie. You know, my daughter's 13. In a year and a half, two years, she's going to be one of those kids learning how to drive. And yeah, I'm really afraid that one of the workers in these trucks may get in his sizable truck and maybe check his text messages, take his eyes off the road for just a second. And it could be a very dangerous accident combined with an enormous amount of noise and dust and pollution that will go right down into the Harpeth, which is just what, 100 feet away? So I strongly oppose this, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Council. Um, I'm, uh, my name is Steve Guild. I live at 7421 East Colony Drive in Nashville. I am in approval of the zoning change. Um, I want to thank Councilperson Mendez for coming earlier and talking. I don't know if there's a copy and paste function in these public hearings. Whatever he said, just put it in here and um, but with that being said I, I am approved to the zoning and I'm opposed to having this lake filled in with uh, demolition debris or construction landfill or even clean rock or dirt uh, for several reasons as stated before that this that was already part of the, the SP that this lake would not get filled in uh, with any other kind of material um, second and any agreement already existing or, or, or negotiated with TDOT only involves having one truckload of, of material from a state highway project come in. Any other material coming in could, could come from any other outside source. Um, this is a definite violation of the Jackson law where you need to have local approval to have a landfill. Once a landfill is approved, it's to the purview of the state if they want to allow any other special wastes to be buried in a landfill. So all it takes is for the landfill owner to go to the state of Tennessee and say, it's okay for us to bury contaminated soil here or asbestos or any other kind of construction or any other material um, that needs to go in there. Um, again, I approve, I support changing the zoning here. Um, I'm opposed to the idea of filling in uh, this landfill. Uh, there's a reason that the Tennessee Scenic Rivers uh, Act was brought up earlier today. This lake is hydrologically connected to the Harpeth River. There's no two ways about it. It's hydrologically connected to Hidden Lake. There's no two ways around that. Whatever ends up in that quarry is going to end up in that river full stop. So that is why the people here today are in support of the zoning change and against filling in this lake. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening, I'm Gwendolyn Blanton. I live at 218 Hillcrest Road in Kingston Springs, which happens to be down river. So I'm not from Davidson County, I'm from Cheatham County, which is 30 minutes from downtown Nashville where I work on Rosa Parks Boulevard. And one of the reasons that people have been moving to Nashville in droves is that we have so many amazing parks. We have the Harpeth River where 350,000 people a year come swim, kayak, canoe, and fish, and also where we get our water that we drink from the Harpeth River, which is downstream. And as the previous gentleman just stated, there is a hydrological connection between this quarry and the Harpeth River, which is literally right next door to it. So anything you put into this landfill, if you were to make it a landfill, is going to end up in the river. My daddy 
was a remodeler. And things have changed now. And there is some controls, but let me just tell you, when you're on the construction site, you throw whatever you want to in that dump. And whatever they go in the dump, whatever they put in that dump, they might call it clean rock and dirt, but they're gonna also put in the paint cans and the whatever, and it's all gonna end up in that quarry. And then it's gonna end up in the Harpeth River, and I live right downstream from that, and so I'm very concerned about the potential for putting a landfill. I would way rather have houses and families, and I would greatly appreciate it if you would approve the uh, zoning change. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you so much to the commission for your time. My name is David Schifrin. I live at 7404 Riverland Drive in the Riverwalk subdivision. And I'm strongly in favor of approval. So I've been writing notes in my planner uh, this afternoon and frankly don't really need them because of something that the property owner just said. It was what I wanted to focus on here. And we are here because essentially the property owners have run out of ideas. He said they've been trying to figure out what to do with this property. They are out of ideas. And then something even more concerning, which is we take this matter seriously. We have offered to put in writing, or we have put in writing. We are here because there is already a significant amount of work in writing, and the property owner is, does, no longer likes what's in writing and wants to change that. And so there is now an end around to the state to try to change that. So I will go back to my notes here and point out that the underlying issue is that this is not a backtrack, it's not a pivot. You pivot when you need to make adjustments. This is a complete 180 degree turn. The property owners said they would not do something and now they are saying this is the only thing we can and will do. This is the only thing we will accept. So that's very concerning that over the course of time people, that we, we have been assured in writing that this would not be an issue and now that somebody else uh, has run out of ideas. We are asked to take the burden. We've already heard about the environmental impact. I'm sure you'll hear more about that, the safety concerns. But unfortunately, it's not our responsibility to, uh, it shouldn't be our responsibility to have to create an environment in which he can, the property owner can have an idea fulfilled when um, the, um, when the cost of that is gonna be borne by those of us uh, who live here and when uh, it requires a massive amount of work here. Um, and frankly, uh, again, as I said, the end around on the state. So I'm very much in favor of approval. Thank you. Come on up. Good evening, my name is Dennis Morse. I live in Boone Trace on Settlers Way. I'm on the HOA board at Boone Trace. I strongly uh, encourage and support uh, the uh, motion to rezone this property. Uh, I live in that area now, and I guess one thing that keeps coming back to me is, it's like Yogi Berra said, it's deja vu all over again. Th this thing's been rehashed, folks, for 10 years. Somebody sat in these chairs and agreed to put in writing that, that this just couldn't happen, but yet, here we are, okay? Here we are again. Um, so what's changed in the last 10 years? Ask yourself that. The Harp of the River is still where it was, right? It hadn't moved. Is the community grown? Yes, it's grown. So you have more and more people that are affected by this. Uh, <clears throat> does anybody know what a C&D landfill takes? Waste other than special waste resulting from construction, remodeling, repair. Such waste are not limited to bricks, concrete, other masonry materials, soil, rock, lumber, road spoils, rebar, paving, other masonry materials. You heard somebody testify last time we were here. You heard somebody testify last time we were here about hauling things, covering things up with, white, with sheetrock, lumber, and dirt that shouldn't be in a landfill. People that actually hauled it. You heard from them personally. So I guess at the end of the day, I'd say 10 years ago or whenever, a group of folks like you sat here with integrity and courage, and they voted not to let them fill up this landfill, I'm asking you to do the same thing. Thank you. Hello again. Grace Stranch, 1317 C Meridian. I'm a national native who grew up in Bellevue where the proposed change is. I'm also the COO and vice president of conservation at the Harpeth River Conservancy. 
Harvest's mission is to restore and protect clean water and healthy ecosystems for rivers in Tennessee. As you can imagine, this zoning request is still near and dear to my heart. I strongly support, as does Harpeth, Councilmember Rosenberg's and your own staff's recommendation to rezone this land from AR2A to R80. The owners bought this property as an unfilled quarry and as such assumed the risk that the property would remain in that state after purchase. So I agree with legal counsel that there is not a taking issue, which I won't go into more detail because I think you already have that recommendation from your legal counsel. There are economic benefits to filling the quarry. There are tipping fees, which owners have explicitly stated they want to charge at past hearings. I am sincerely concerned about the commercialization of filling this quarry. While there is an ARAP permit, there are plenty of examples of when permits have been violated and led to the contamination of our water. This time, last year, TDEC found a violation of an ARAP permit at a quarry that caused pollution of a creek in Chattanooga. This fear that we have is not unfounded. It just happened last year in Tennessee. Who is tasked with monitoring this fill of the quarry? The owners are tasked with monitoring the fill. Petroleum contaminated soils can be, but are not necessarily different in color from regular soil. So even the most vigilant operator being very careful and looking at the soil can still easily miss since dangerous, dangerous chemicals that can then go into the Harpeth River. This is how permits can be violated, even when it's not intentional. So I hope that uh, you will, uh, we support the zoning and we ask um, that you listen to your staff's recommendation and approve this request. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. My name is Melissa Stewart. I live at 7933 Moon Trace. I'm a widow. I've lived there two years. I'm asking you to approve this rezoning because of the loaded of the waste, uh, not all the gas, the toxic gas, the landfill affects humans' health, my health, and all the 1,200 people that live in the four neighborhoods in our area. It affects the wildlife, and then it also releases toxic gases that I do not want to be around, and as members of the commission, I appreciate all you do, and I hope that you go with what we all would like and approve this rezoning. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. Um, I'm here once again. I was here a few weeks ago and spent six hours with you all. I had a great time. <laughs> uh, we did, too. I, I, I'm Eric Lewis. I live at 7978 Highway 100. My wife and I have had 300 feet of river frontage along the Harpeth River for 33 years. And on warm summer days, we sit on our deck overlooking the river and watch a continuous parade of canoes, kayaks, inner tubes, and swimmers going by. It's a very popular river, the Harpeth. And it's only 400 feet from that big hole in the ground. So I'm concerned about what goes in that hole is going in in our river. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening, and thank you for your time this evening. As a local resident and as a frequent visitor to the Hidden Lake State Park, I fully support the rezoning of the Hutton property. The Hutton property sits directly, and I mean directly, in front of Hidden Lake State Park. This park is one of Nashville's gems, and if you haven't been there, you must go see it. It's beautiful, and it has this amazing, unique history, and it draws visitors from all over. There are photographers, birders, butterfly enthusiasts, nature lovers, and just those simply seeking a peace, the peace and tranquility of a park setting. If the owner is allowed to have his way, there will be negative consequences for the thousands of visitors. This quiet sanctuary will be subject to noise, traffic, dust, and of course, the environmental impacts. It is estimated that over 6,000 trucks will run through this location 
per year for years to come. Each truck will create noise, traffic, and pose increased safety hazards. Um, noise will be created by the tractors and the backhoes emanating from the site for hours every day for years to come. There will be air pollution from the machinery on site along with the dust from the fill itself. Again, for years to come. In addition to the impacts the owner's proposal will have on the visitors at Hidden Lake, the impacts will also be felt by those who are laying their loved ones to rest. Those who are visiting their loved ones, please support the rezoning. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. Um, hi, my name is Amy Frogan. I live at 7237 Riverfront Drive. I'm a member of the Riverwalk community that is impacted by this proposal. Um, as others have already said tonight, the quarry is located in a beautiful, undeveloped natural area that is in very close proximity to both the Harpeth River and a state park. The owner of the quarry is a venture capitalist who has promised not to turn the quarry into a dump, but has now reneged on his promise. The owners do not live in our community. There is a reasonable proposal now on the table that would allow the owners of this uh, property to profit from their real estate investment. And in fact, as this gentleman said tonight, they have profited from this, this investment. And as venture capitalists and investors, surely they underst understood the risk they undertook in purchasing this quarry. However, that's not good enough. And they've now hired a lobbyist to lobby at the state capitol for a change in state law that would allow a landfill. This change in state law would usurp both community will and local control so that this matter is out of all of our hands. This truly is about personal greed at the expense of a community. The landfill would negatively impact the safety, health, and well-being of hundreds of families and children in nearby neighborhoods, literally thousands of people, not to mention the impact that it would have on the environment and the natural green spaces surrounding the uh, quarry property. Uh, I'm asking tonight that you support the will of our community and support the zoning proposal. Thank you so much for your time and thank you all for your service. Thank you. Come on up. Welcome. Good evening. I am Robin Haynes. I live at 828 Stirrup Drive, Nashville, 37221. Bellevue. Um, I moved to Nashville in 1970. I moved to Bellevue in 1974. I grew up running around Newsom's Mill and the Harpeth River and Hidden Lake before it was a state park when it was just somebody's farmland. And the Narrows, I was just on the Harpeth River Tuesday running the river. I love that area. It is a beautiful, natural area that cannot be replaced or replicated if it is damaged. Um, it is a place where I bring visitors and they say, I cannot believe that this exists. And I wouldn't have made it through this much of the COVID pandemic without that space for serenity. And I think a lot of us use that as our well of well-being. Um, as far as, oh, I also own property now in Bellevue. I have a house. Um, well, I just told you where it was. <laughs> but I have raised two daughters that are adults in that area. And I have a son that I'm raising now. They all did learn to drive on those roads. So as far as danger, six heavy dump trucks an hour going down those roads is much more dangerous than a quarry could ever be. So I am in support of the rezoning and I thank you for your time and service. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, my name is Joel Kincaid. I'm at 7244 Riverfront Drive. I live uh, in a riverfront community across the river from the quarry. And um, I, 
I don't know the owner. Don't know if he's a good person or not. Not here to judge the owner. I just know that if property is worth absolute zero, like he says, um, I'm sure we could donate it to the city of Nashville and make a good use of it. Uh, there's a reason why he's holding on to the property, and uh, it's a reason that we don't want to see go further. I'd also say that uh, other than a property owner, um, I'm also a veteran, 22 years of active duty military service. And where this is located uh, would be a disgrace to put a dump of any kind next to our veteran cemetery. I don't think it, uh, I or any of us or any of you want our veteran cemetery to be known as the veteran cemetery out by the dump. Thank you. Thank you. Next. I'm going to be super quick. My name is Nora Lamone, and I live at 2055 Griffin Town Road in White Bluff. I live downstream a little bit. I've been in this house for 18 years, and during that time I've become very partial to the Harpeth River. I just want to echo what everyone else has said. Basically, what goes into this landfill goes into the Harpeth and I want to protect the Harpeth. So please support the rezoning. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. I will also try to be brief and not repeat all these great points that have already been made. Uh, my name is Ryan Finnegan. I live at 8444 Beautiful Valley Drive. Um, you'll notice that's Beautiful Valley, not Landfill Valley. We moved there 10 years ago um, specifically for the nature, um, the quietness of the neighborhood. It's the part of Nashville that we've come to love the best, um, and for a lot of those reasons. Um, we understand development is coming, and I don't think any of us in this room are completely opposed to development. What we are opposed, um, I don't know if any of you have children, but I have two toddlers, and so I am very skilled at saying no to the same question asked different ways. And I think we as the people are very, very tired of saying no to the same question just ask different ways. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, can you hear me? I got to yes, stand on my toes. Okay. You can pull it down. Thank you. There you go. Hi, my name is Suzanne Lanier, and I live in River Plantation at 983 Todd Priest Drive. Um, I don't have this written down, but I do want to say something that's different. It really bothers me that when somebody agrees to something at the commission and then later on decides, wait a minute, I don't like that decision. I think I'm going to go around the commission and go to the state and have my way. You know, mm -mm. I'm sorry. Y'all are the ones that make the real estate decisions, not people at the state. Planning commission members, ours is a government of the people by the people and for the people. Please take your responsibility to this seriously. Developing property to its highest purpose is important. But so are the concerns of the residents already in that area. A person's home is usually an owner's most valuable asset and should not be diminished by the desires of other property owners and developers. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. Hi, Karen Waterman, 9063 Old Charlotte Pike in Pegram, Davidson County, Tennessee. I would ask each of you to please vote in favor of the rezoning proposal set forth by our council person, Mr. Rosenberg. Your mission statement says that you all guide the growth and development as Nashville and Davidson County evolve into a more socially, economically, and environmentally sustainable community with a commitment to preservation of important assets. Please follow that mission this evening and preserve the asset of our neighborhood. And don't let the quality of our lives um, be detrimentally affected just to increase the quality of one person's bank account. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Mark Marshall at 8509 Newsom Station Road. I want to thank you all for your patience and your incredible service to this community. And please approve this. Thank you. Council Lady? Thank you. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, good to be here. Um, I wanted to come in and add my voice, not just as a council member at large, but also as a resident of Bellevue. And for me, when it comes to zoning, I try not to put myself in the middle of it because as at large, I have to listen to everyone. In this particular case, the overwhelming uh, messages and that what I hear is that the community wants this rezoning approved. And I think it's important for us to listen to our constituents. The other reason that I also think it's important is that we do not want to set a president where we make a decision, someone agreed to do something, but then they find a way to go around it. The fact that someone have access to be able to go to the state, I think is very disturbing. We, talk, we always talk about Nashville for everyone, where everyone has a voice. In this case, we need to listen to the voice of the people that live in the area, and we should not let someone circumvent it. Not all of us have the means and the capacity to go to the state to, <laughs> to go against what the city's already decided. And so that's an upper hand that we're giving to somebody that not everybody have access to. And that, for me, is very important. And so reneging on a promise is trying to go around it and listening to the people, I think it's very crucial in this case. So I, I add my voice as a resident to be able to say, please approve the rezoning. And time is of the essence because we need to do it as soon as possible before the state comes around and change this on us. So listen to everyone that lives there. Listen to all the people that I've spoken and I hope that you would do what you needed to do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Appreciate you coming down. Lisa Byram, 8446 Marymount Drive. I speak in favor of the proposed amendment to the property, and I'm echoing all of those things that you've heard already tonight. Um, in particular, nothing has changed, and yet this comes to you again because all of you are new. And it's like the other gentleman said with the parents. If you've raised more than one child, you know that, or even just the one, that they will ask a question and then you're in a different mood or it's the other parent and that child asks the same question. That's what's happening here. So I echo my, my neighbors and my constituents um, and all the comments that you've heard before opposing the landfill and supporting the amendment to the property. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, my name is Marsha Leach and this is my husband, Jim. We live at 716 Settlers Court, which is the very furthest point closest to the quarry oh, there. The yes, and we back up to the river. We have no homes behind us, and that is directly across from what is proposed this evening. So we are very thankful that all these people, our neighbors, came out yeah. tonight to talk about this. Um, this is very concerning to us as we purchased our home 10 years ago. We purchased it because it's a nice, quiet, wonderful neighborhood and we love our backyard and we plan on retiring there. And now all of this is happening and it's very scary for us. This is not what we were planning. And um, so we wholeheartedly agree with what's happening tonight and hope that you will hear and follow your conscience. I'd like to also add, uh, this area was dramatically uh, affected by the 2010 flood. Um, virtually all the houses on that end were flooded, including yes. ours. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the water has never uh, crusted the bank in the 10 years that we've been there until this last uh, spring. Mm -hmm. And um, the water got about mm, 10 feet from our house. Mm -hmm. So our entire backyard was part of the river. Right. And water came down the hill from the quarry and spilled into the Harpeth for right. three straight days. Right, right. So it will leach into the harbor yes. after it's even finished if it were to yes. be done. Yes. So we just have great concerns and we appreciate you and your time and everyone else who came out tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. My name is Kimberly Richard. Um, um, 1213 Beautiful Valley Court. And thank you for your service. I appreciate um, you listening to all of us tonight. Um, I've lived in Boone Trace since 1998. Uh, actually, my house was the very first house to be built in Beautiful Valley. Um, looking at that, um, <laughs> I am about 500 feet from the Harpeth River, about 1,200 feet from uh, the quarry. Um, one of the things that's the biggest concern for me is that the other day I was driving down the road and I decided to, I saw a CND dumpster, decided to pull over and take a look at it and see what was inside. 
climbed up, looked over, there was rock and dirt in there, but there was also a vacuum cleaner, paint cans, and somebody's house gutters. So no telling what was up underneath all of that, but that was going to a C&D landfill. So for me, that is a very big concern. Um, there's 5,000 residents that this would really greatly impact. Also, the Veterans Cemetery. Um, it's a very peaceful place. It's across the street, along with Hidden Lake. People go there all the time. They go there to enjoy the hiking. They also go there to um, enjoy peace. And then the same thing for the Veterans Cemetery, the people that go and want not to be disturbed while they're visiting their loved ones. With that being said, the noise, the constant beeping of backing up trucks, the dust that it will actually create, uh, dust is known as a major health hazard. And I don't want that in my backyard. And I don't think you would, or you would, or you would, or you would. You would not want that in your backyard. That's not what Nashville Next is about. I'm about growth. I want the Bellevue community to continue to grow and get stronger, but this is not the right answer. So please, I ask you to rezone this property. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Fred Page. I live at 4615 Heath Road in Nashville, uh, about a mile approximately uh, northeast of uh, the lake, uh, the proposed landfill. Um, not want to take up a lot of your time, but just want to say that, you know, it, we, we've had promises that nothing will go into this uh, former quarry except clean fill. In other words, clean dirt, all of that. I don't hear that uh, the company that owns the property will be monitoring every single load of that 200,000 trucks that comes into, uh, dump its load into uh, Hutton Lake. And Consequently, it makes me think that there are, is likely to be other things than uh, completely clean fill. You know, if a, a demolition is taking place, as I think somebody else mentioned earlier, and that truck brings items from a demolished home or a demolished building, uh, just two things I'm aware of as a firefighter, fire marshal, and that is that any uh, dimension lumber before that was made before 2003 contains a significant amount of arsenic. I can read you the chemical thing here, but I won't. Uh, contains a significant amount of arsenic. And that arsenic will leach out of that wood and will wind up eventually in the Harpeth River. The same thing about uh, th the uh, things that make ceiling tiles, again, before that time, also floral linoleum glue before that time, contained asbestos, and we don't want that going into the river either. So I encourage you to, to approve. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the commission. Uh, my name is Boo Sanders, and I live at 105 Spring Ridge Lane, which is right on McCory Lane. I'm not going to take a lot of time, but a couple of my concerns is, if you're going to drain it, wouldn't you need a liner? Is there going to be a liner? If there's not a liner, I would think things would eventually seep down into the beautiful Harpeth River. If you've ever been out there, and Commissioner Haynes, your dad, years ago, we fought something, and Joe Haynes said when he would go to the Loveless Cafe, he would drive down McCrory Lane in the beauty of the trees and the nature and for someone to come in here to try to drain this beautiful, beautiful quarry, I hope and I pray that each and every one of y'all would rethink this and decide to do the zoning of the R80. Little piece of history, you can go there, Al Capone, that's where they used to come, from Chicago to Hidden Lakes to the quarry. You can go up top and you can see the old dance floor. You can actually remember, I have a dear friend that lives down the road. There were a bar, a bar which was called the Bloody Bucket. And that's the truth. 
<laughs> but <laughs> thank you. Um, but anyway, not to make matters laughing or what have you, I live on Macquarie Lane. I love the beauty. And I am sorry, I go there and I go fishing. It's illegal, but there are bald eagles. And several weeks ago, I caught 11 and a half pound largemouth bass. That's a big bass. That's Thank big you. Bass. Thank you very much. Well, good, good fish story. Hi, I'm uh, Wade Elder, 9017 Poplar Creek Road in Nashville. Um, I'm concerned about the trucks. I lived off of Robertson Road for 15 years, one block off, and there's a thousand trucks a day, big trucks, dump trucks, cement trucks, and all that, coming up and down that road, a thousand. And we're actively working to try to get them off there now, and it's, and it's happening. Um, I've seen horrific wrecks with these trucks. The speed limit's 30, they're always doing 40. They take their half, um, since they're so wide and long, and 60 tons or some number, they take their half the road out of the middle. I've been forced off that road I don't know how many times. McCrory Lane's a beautiful country road that winds up and down. It's narrow. There's no curbs. There's no off-street parking. If you have a flat tire on McCrory Lane, you cannot get physically off the pavement. There's no way. There's big drops. Um, six trucks have been proposed per hour. That's going to end up 30 an hour. Who's going to monitor this stuff? You put a lot of big trucks on McCrory, you'll turn it into the, one of the most dangerous roads in Tennessee. And I'm so I'm, I'm for the proposal to uh, change the zoning. McCrory Lane just can't handle it. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, I'm Julie Strickland. I live at 8640 Poplar Creek Road. I've lived there for 11 years and I've been living in West Nashville for over 30 years. I'm in agreement with all those who've spoken in favor of this item. I'm especially offended by the workaround attempt of hiring a lobbyist to, uh, to supersede our commissioner's previous zonings. I'd like to acknowledge the owner's willingness to pay penalties, which indicates that their profits will be more than enough to absorb those penalties, as well as their expectations of said penalties. I'm concerned about our community with the number of projects that have already been approved around my home and Macquarie Lane, but my biggest concern lies in the impact of our waterways and our green space. Please approve the zoning request. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, Commissioners. My name is Stephen Walsh. I live at 4474 Heath Road. Uh, I, my house backs up to the Harpeth River. Um, I have Highway 70 in between, but my house is about 600 feet away from the river. I have a few prepared remarks here. I appreciate all of your time this evening. I know this is going on quite a while. Everybody's probably getting pretty hungry for dinner. Um, as a Nearby resident and property owner, I'm here tonight to discuss to the Planning Commission my strong opposition to the proposed Macquarie Lane landfill. Metro Nashville has already determined in 2006 that this land does not meet the standards for a C and D landfill. So now the landowners appear to be going around our local municipality to gain zoning rights for their land. Due to the Corps' direct proximity to the Harpeth River and multiple dense residential subdivisions, there is legitimate concern about dangerous toxic pollutants flooding and leaching into the nearby Harpeth River and groundwater. The Harpeth River is part of the Harpeth Valley Utility District and tributes into the Cumberland River, where Harpeth Valley Utility District drinking water is sourced, water my family and I drink every day, as well as everybody else. <clears throat> I'm not against finding useful purposes for old rock quarries. However, the potential risks at the McCrory Lane location far outweigh the potential benefits and convenience. I implore our local commissioners to help stop this from happening. Please help protect the long-term safety of our community's environment and drinking water over the short-term private interests at play. Additionally, there are other legitimate environmental and safety impacts that a CND landfill would pose in the area. Additional heavy rock truck traffic air noise and dust pollution from the trash loads, dump trucks, and heavy equipment used for such operations. All directly across the street from the beautiful Harpeth River State Park Hidden Lake and across from 1,200 residential homes. The residents of this community are depending on Metro Planning Commissioners to do what is right in protecting and correctly applying Sir. our local zoning laws. Sir. Please help. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hi, 
I'm Teresa Feltner and I live at 7453 Riverland Drive in Riverwalk. And I'm only up here because I did not hear this concern addressed earlier. When McCrory Lane Interstate was built, it was when there was hardly any property that had been residential. It was a vast area of land. The entrance to I-40 east, going east from McCrory, that interstate is not built for dump trucks to enter. It has a very, very short entranceway, and it's very dangerous on a regular basis. Maybe six dump trucks doesn't seem like very much to the owners. It does to all of us. It is a very dangerous entrance way, and before anything would be done, I would like for you to please consider evaluating that for a safety aspect. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. I'll try to keep it as short as possible. <laughs> uh, my name is Sean Benson. I live at 8468 Indian Hills Drive, just down McCrory Lane. Lived there a few years now, and as the resident annoying professor of political science here, there are a couple things I have noticed haven't been mentioned, so I'll just briefly mention those. Uh, primarily, that for all that I'm sympathetic with the property owner, that he wants to maximize the economic potential over time. There are safety concerns, environmental concerns. There are also economic concerns for the local community. Having, whether it's a landfill or any other leaching that goes into the Harpeth or whatever, will dramatically and negatively impact the boom that Bellevue is currently experiencing. Essentially, this rezoning is a compromise that benefits both sides, and I would urge you all to approve it, and I would urge the property owner to give up and just accept the compromise as it is. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Very briefly, I urge that you approve this rezoning. It not only affects the local area, I am direct directly affected. I live in Kingston Springs where my water comes from the Harpeth. So we're concerned about the quality of the water, the leaching in, and you've heard all the other reasons. Please approve this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? All right, seeing none, you have a two-minute rebuttal, sir. Come on up, property owner. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'll try to address as many of the uh, points that were made that were inaccurate. I understand when people get excited, uh, they can be aroused and they can be misinformed. Uh, for example, let me just run down them real quickly. Uh, at the previous zoning before the Planning Commission, back when we got the if you look at that, it's the part above the red line. When we got that parcel rezoned, that was the only piece of property that was before the commission. The other part wasn't even there. The other part came up when the staff, right before the third reading, inserted some language on an adjacent piece of property. We have not agreed to do anything previously with the quarry, pro uh, the quarry pit. We just simply haven't. Number two, uh, there are 20 landfills in Ashland City. Trucks are driving down 70 and McCroy Lane every day going to Ashland City to dump C&D landfill material. Now, we're not a C&D landfill. That's the next thing. We're not that. We are clean rock and dirt. Somebody said, well, nobody will be monitoring it. That's false. There's a, our, our partner. His building is adjacent to the gate that stops people from going onto the property. Every single load that is dumped out of a dump truck will be dumped onto the ground where an operator will look at it. Every single load that comes there, we will know where it's coming from and we'll have approved it before we let it through the gate. Historic property. That was an operating rock quarry until 15 years ago. There's nothing historic about an operating rock quarry. We've got to fill that thing. Everybody talks about how uh, Nashville's growing, and that's true.
Well, what's going to happen when children start going there and drowning in the quarry? And that happens, by the way, across the entire country. And last, lastly, the material that goes in there is, can only be C&D landfill, I mean, can only be rock, can only be Thank rock you, and sir. dirt, can, can only be rock and Thank dirt you, sir. under penalty of law, and we go to jail. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Now, we made a deal not to have any outbursts. This is not a protest. It's a fair hearing. And when we have outbursts, it becomes unfair. So we don't, it's a professional meeting, okay? So everyone had their ability to say what they had to say. It's not a protest. This is not an appropriate place for that. Okay. Now, Councilman. Thank you, and uh, thanks, y'all, for your time. Thanks, everybody, for being here and, and speaking all those concerns. Um, before I start, um, a few things. The partner we're supposed to depend on had an illegal rock, rock crushing operation. This is Tennessee, and nobody goes to jail for environmental regulations. I think you get a pat on the back. Staff doesn't add things to zoning bills before third reading. Um, Hidden Lake across the street is gorgeous. If you've, if you've never been, it's um, around the lake, there's a really high, very narrow um, walking trail. And you have to, my son walks sideways and does, like, like he's a crab because you have to walk sideways to get around there. I'm glad I just did that in public. Um, and that Hidden Lake used to be a quarry, by the way. Um, and lastly, Google Maps is great for seeing the spatial aspect of things and seeing things in two dimensions. But I really hate that because it doesn't show you how beautiful that is. It doesn't show you how hilly McCrory Lane is. Um, it just really doesn't do justice. And it looks all brown and nasty. And it's green and beautiful over there. Um, so I'd like to take a step back and talk about how we ended up here. So in 2006, the current owners pushed hard to put a C&D landfill in our neighborhood. It didn't go well, so they began working toward other ways to increase the value of the property. In December 2006, the Planning Commission heard a request to amend the Bellevue Community Plan for that area that's up there on the map. And staff recommended that a special policy be adopted, and that policy said, quote, the quarry itself is to remain undisturbed and unfilled, end quote, and that was approved. In March 2007, the Planning Commission heard an application for 180 townhomes brought by McCrory Lane Partners. The action taken was to approve with conditions, one of which said, quote, no dumping or fill of any materials of any type into the quarry site, end quote. Subsequent to that, the bill went to the Metro Council as a disapproved bill, but an amendment was added after what the sponsor described as a large series of meetings with the community, other stakeholders, and council members. And that amendment stated, quote, no dumping or fill of any off-site materials of any type shall be permitted in the quarry site. The council attorney deemed the bill approved with the adding of those conditions and it passed. That condition pushed by the Metropolitan Planning Commission and the Metropolitan Council created a great deal of value for the property owners. It made it so that that parcel was worth $1 the $1.9 million that they sold it for. Without agreeing to that condition, it wouldn't have had anything approaching that value. So let there be no mistake, they made nearly $2 million by agreeing to that provision, and they're trying to undo it here tonight. And they're saying it's our job to pretend like that's not happening. It requires an extraordinary suspension of disbelief to buy that argument. If you allow them to get away with this end around, we'll have no control over what happens on that site. Any promises will be meaningless. We won't be able to control operating hours. We won't be able to control excessive noise. And if the townhouse property gets built, they will literally have this C and D in their front yard. That, commissioners, is a taking. They are devaluing the very property that made them so much money, trying to make a little bit more. It violates our distance requirements, which say you can't do that next to a, a, a residential area. It violates that property zoning. It violates truck restrictions that were put on this, put on this road because it's a windy country road. And it violates the spirit of the Jackson Law, which gives us, the community, control over this kind of activity. I'd like to take a, uh, 
touch on the safety aspect as well, because it's really a pretty high quality bit of spin that the owners have brought to you. There was another condition to that windfall that came the property owner's way, and it was laid out by the planning staff, by the commission, by the council, and it required the property owners to secure the property from trespassers. And they failed to do that, that, that they have failed to do this is not something they get to use to argue that they get to fail at following their other conditions. To my knowledge, all they've done is put up a cheap chain link fence around the property and have some cameras that's monitored part-time by the illegal rock crusher. In addition, the safety concerns have not been repetitive, but one tragic death more than a decade to you, more than a decade ago. I submit that we have lakes, man-made and natural, all over the Nashville area and the state, rivers and swimming pools too. There are tragically drowning sometimes when there's water, and nobody's proposing draining Radnor Lake, Percy Priest Lake, our neighbor's backyard swimming pool, or any other place that human beings and water interact. It's the owner's responsibility to secure the property. And if they can't do that, can't make use of the lake in a substantive, beneficial way, can't come up with any other use for the property, then nobody is stopping them from selling that property. Or, given how much money we already made them from rezoning based on the various agreements they're not inclined to follow, they can donate the land, which is worth all of $79,000. That brings us back to the situation before us. You have in front of you a proposal that, though called a rezoning, actually just preserves the existing zoning and protects it from preemption. You have a community that's very united, which is really hard to find these days. You have state and local officials who are united in support, the planning staff in support of the application, Metro Legal citing firm legal ground with this application, and the property owners when they were $2 million poor in support of this application. The opposition comes from the people trying to go behind the back of the Metropolitan Planning Commission and the Metropolitan Council to undo their prior agreement because of course they're opposed to it because that's the only reason we have to be here to begin with. The community, elected officials, planning staff, land use policy, legal earlier agreements with ownership all point in one direction. United, cut and dry. Please approve this application for further consideration by the council. Thank you all sincerely for your time. Thank you, Council Member. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Uh, Commissioner Tibbs, you want to start us off? Um, I guess first, I, I know I would brought up last time, and I appreciate Councilman for reaching out and trying to definitely speak with the owner, um, and it sounds like they had a conversation, and that's, that, that was my, my biggest concern last time. Um, and based on um, not not just the um, community, but just kind of the facts of it all, I am more um, in favor of um, favor of staff recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, thank you, everybody uh, coming here and you know express uh, your opinion. I really appreciate that. So. Uh, you know, some of the commissioners are here when we had, uh, you know, public hearing in September, and some of the commissioners are not here. So, but, uh, you know, at that time, I think uh, the question raised was, because this is rather unusual zoning request, because it did not come from a property owner, and rather coming from uh, the council member. So one question was, by, approving this zone change, are we taking partial land use? I think that was a question. So since we had about a month, uh, it gave me lots of time to go through metro uh, ordinance or metro cause. So I think, you know, if this zone change request were in a way, as property owner comes in, ask for CND landfill. Because what property owners are proposing, no matter how clean or, you know, that is, it's under the metro cause or land use, it's a category of CND landfill. So if CND landfill, if, you know, property owner ask for the uh, zone change to allow CND landfill, uh, probably, you know, considering uh, surrounding existing neighborhood and so forth. 
our recommendation would be no. But you know, since uh, this is a zone change uh, coming from uh, you know council member, so C and D landfill is only allowed uh, industrial zoning and uh, AL two A as a special exception. So two special exception, they have to you know the landfill has to meet certain condition, one of which is setback. So, you know, metro setback, it's really, you know, cut and dry, it's very clear. Because C and D landfill, as existing regulation, they cannot meet the requirement because it, C and D landfill has to be 100 feet from any property line, cannot be 100, okay, setback all building structure and is setback is 100 feet from any property line, 250 feet from any residential zoning district boundary. So 250 feet, you know, the uh, SP to the, I think, uh, north is residential, you know, property. The edge of the lake to, you know, the boundary is less than 250 feet. Moreover, uh, so, and further, the facility shall not be located less than 2,000 feet from property line of any school or park. So across from that landfill, there is a park with veteran cemetery. So the depth of the uh, property in the red, if the you know, dumping or any storage or those activity were to occur very back of the property. The property line to the park is less than 2,000 feet. So as of the existing, you know, the property, the CND landfill cannot be operated under the existing metro ordinance. So, you know, if we are, what, property owner is asking is circumvent all of this metro regulation and ask us to allow C and D landfill. So in that sense, you know, you may feel much, much comfortable because we are not taking away any land use currently allowed. Rather, we are enforcing what you are asking for, planning to do, is already not allowed in the metro zoning and metro ordinance. So that's, you know, hopefully that will give you a little comfort. And also, you know, again and again, it was brought up uh, the SP of the 2006. In order for them to have SP on the north, one of the condition is not allow uh, the CND landfill or, you know, filling to the quarry. So in order for us to allow CND landfill, we have to first amend existing SP because otherwise, because against the existing condition. So without amendment of the SP, the property owner will not be able to operate what they are planning to do. And I would like to touch on the ARAP uh, permit because aqua resource alteration permit. So property owner went to TDEC and it took nearly two years, no, actually more. So I went through all the document, and yes, indeed, they got, uh, you know, uh, ARAP uh, permit. But what ARAP permit says is kind of misleading because, you know, because they got ARAP permit, maybe we feel like, yes, they are ready to do the landfill. No. First, they have to empty the water. So empty the water, they have to have another permit in order for them to empty. So this ARAP they got is how they can do it, what they can put it, and uh, approving the easement because within their you know, property, they don't have enough uh, area to conduct a pipe to drain existing water in the quarry. So they have to have easement to the next property. So that this ARAP is actually you know, to me, it's like how to do it, what can be done, 
it's not, you know, you can operate right away. So it's not that kind of permit. So in that sense, again, we are not taking away any rights from the property owner. So that's, uh, the, you know, I just wanted to point out. So again, you know, when you take a look at the larger picture, you know, looking at uh, community plan and looking at safety, you know, safety issue, when we, talk about, uh, you know, uh, subdivision. Health and safety of the community is the one of the condition we always consider. So dump truck going up and down narrow McCrawley Lane, you know, day after day, except Sunday, that would be a safety hazard. And also, you know, they have to meet with a regulation water coming in to discharge to the Harpeth River, and they have to monitor, but, you know, that would be another safety concern as well, because monitoring is not a TDEC coming in every day. Monitoring is, uh, you know, the contractor is monitoring just twice a week. But if some accident happened, it's too late. So all these conditions, I am really in favor of staff recommendation because it's meet the plan and it's meet our overall our goal to protect existing neighborhood. Thank you, Councilman Withers. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Chair, and thank you to my mm -hmm. colleagues who've spoken already. Um, I know that uh, colleagues who were here in September had uh, heard a lot from the community uh, at that time. It was very late in the day uh, at that meeting, but uh, y'all have had a little bit more time as commissioners to think about this case and research it uh, than I have, but I uh, was able to go back and review the footage of that uh, planning commission hearing just to make sure that I was uh, up to speed on, on what the discussion entailed. Um, and obviously as uh, Metro Council members, we have had some correspondence that's been sent to the council uh, from a representatives of the applicant, as well as from Council Member Rosenberg. So that had been uh, distributed through the council office. It's a matter of public record, of course, but it had been uh, on uh, my and some of my Metro Council colleagues' radar screen for a little while just to get background on it. Really appreciate this uh, additional information that was given to us today that uh, gives us a little bit more of that legislative history going all the way back to uh, when Council Member Tigard uh, worked on this. Um, I never served with Council Member Tigard, but I knew him uh, very well as a community member and always found him to be uh, very, uh, a strong advocate for the Bellevue community uh, and also highly diligent. He really knew what he was talking about and he worked very closely with uh, Metro departments and, uh, and, and I see a lot of evidence of that community advocacy for Bellevue and this documentation from the Metro Council meeting at that time, as well as his great thoughtfulness in putting together a good plan. So uh, I'm persuaded uh, that um, uh, that it's always been a, a, a it's, it's been a, just a, a stated fact that filling this quarry has not been permitted for a very, very long time uh, through different council bodies, through different planning commission bodies. Um, and so while it is true that zoning can always be changed, someone can always change their mind and come back with a request, um, I don't find any policy reason that would the council, the planning commission would need to change that. The, the um, zoning that is requested allows a very similar amount of residential density to, to what is there currently. Um, the policy in the area does call for residential. There's an SP, I believe, to the north that has a residential use to it and having continuity of residential zoning uh, in, in adjacent parcels would be I think har harmonious uh, to, to having some consistency in the area, uh, regardless of whether the quarry uh, remains in its current state or turns into some other kind of a community amenity, which could also happen. But um, I'm persuaded that it's been a, uh, a stated fact for many, many years now that uh, it, it was understood that this could not be filled. Uh, I don't see anything that has changed that. Um, and I support the staff recommendation that this uh, requested zoning for residential zoning meets policy. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Haynes. First, 
Councilman Rosenberg, thank you for taking the time to meet with the applicant. You heeded my request and I appreciate that. Councilor Suara, I think you made a very compelling case. Uh, I am troubled by going around local ordinance and getting state legislatures involved in this. That's not how we want to run our government. Uh, and after researching this, since I'm the one that suggested a deferral four weeks ago, I am inclined to support staff's recommendation. Thank you, Vice Chair. I don't have a lot to add to my fellow commissioners, but I do want to thank Commissioner Johnson for a very thorough uh, research that she did. That was very helpful. Um, I, you know, from, at, at a very basic level, this is a policy, a zone change that is consistent with policy, and that's what we're looking at. And um, so with that, I will make a motion to support staff's recommendation um, to approve the zone change. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? Commissioner Johnson seconds it. Any other discussion? Saying none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. All right. Chairman, while we're waiting on folks to clear out. Hey, everybody, if you guys, we're, so we're still in the meeting, so if you could quickly exit so we can finish. We really appreciate everybody coming down. Thank you. Uh, we're going to just give everybody a minute to exit. All right, let's next case, case number 26. Well, before we do case 26, is there, are there still folks here that oppose 26? If you'll raise your hand, do y'all, anybody oppose item 26? Is there anyone here that objects to it? Let's, is, is everyone here in support of 26? Is that the case? Let's try to straighten this out. Hold on. Our director is, is trying to figure that out. Uh, so I, I do see a couple of gentlemen in the back. What case are you all here for? I want to ask. No, nothing. Okay. Okay. Item 26. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Logan Elliott, the planning department. I'll be presenting item 26 on tonight's agenda. The request is to apply a detached accessory dwelling unit or a DADU overlay uh, district. Staff's recommendation is to approve with a substitute bill. The, the approximately 300 acre site is located in North Nashville and makes up a majority of the area south of Clay Street, west of Interstate 65, north of Interstate 40, and east of 26th Avenue North. The area is primary residential with some vacant and some institutional land uses. 
The area has a development pattern of single family and two family residential with the gridded street network. The area is generally served by a network of public alleys and many of the streets in this area have sidewalks. The properties north of Buchanan Avenue and east of Dr. D.B. Todd Jr. Boulevard are designated as worthy of conservation by Metro Historic. And the zoning of the site is primarily RS5 and R6 with limited instances of R6A. And staff is recommending approval with the substitute to remove parcels that are zoned SP and CN as these parcels do not meet the DADU overlay criteria in the Metro Zoning Code. The policy for the area is a variety of policies, uh, including neighborhood evolving, neighborhood maintenance, urban civic, urban open space, and mixed use corridor. I would like to note that staff is recommending for the mixed use corridor policy to be removed from the application. So looking at the neighborhood evolving policy, staff finds that the proposed DADU overlay is consistent with the policy guidance to provide greater housing choice and to provide for infill development that provides for an increased housing diversity. The T4 neighborhood evolving policy describes that successful infill and redevelopment in existing neighborhoods needs to take into account considerations such as timing and elements of the existing developed character, such as the street network and block structure and the proximity to centers and corridors. And staff finds that the design standards in the DADU overlay zoning code would limit the impact to the existing neighborhood's character and that the area within the neighborhood evolving policy is well served by infrastructure with its proximity to mixed use corridors, uh, the existing gridded public street network, the public alleys and the sidewalks, and is well served by infrastructure to support appropriate infill. Looking at the neighborhood maintenance policy, staff also finds that the DADU is consistent with this policy guidance. Uh, the DADU overlay will allow for additional density to occur in this established neighborhood while re retaining the physical character of the neighborhood. Again, the design standards of the DADU overlay code will uh, limit the disruption, disruption to the existing development pattern of this area. And again, this area is well served uh, with infrastructure with its proximity to mixed use corridors, gridded streets, public alleys, and sidewalks. The open space and civic policy is very limited in this area. Uh, the limited instances of this is for public property that has residential zoning. Should these parcels develop under the residential zoning, this application would allow these properties to construct the DADU similar to the adjoining parcels. Uh, examples of these public uh, agencies that own these properties are Metro Government Schools, the Power Board, uh, Metro Parks. Staff finds the proposed overlay to be consistent with the policies for this area and recommends approval with a substitute. Again, the substitute is to remove parcels from the scope of the application because they do not meet the zoning criteria for the DADU overlay. That completes my presentation. I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you, Logan. And so we'll go ahead and open this item for public hearing. The applicant is the councilman. The councilman is not, I don't believe he's here. Councilman Brandon Taylor, he's not here. And so we will go on to anyone wishing to speak in support. All right, seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. And uh, please state your name. You got two minutes and name and address. Welcome. Uh, good evening. Hi, I am Angel Sims. Um, I own suburban and urban real estate services located at 10th and Jefferson in North Nashville, and I live at 2712 O'Neill Drive in North Nashville. I am in opposition of this for many reasons. Um, let me start by, I just jotted down a couple of notes in between running. After many decades of being overlooked and left out and behind is simply uh, a desert for resources, North Nashville. Um, at this point in time, introducing more density, as they call it, um, these detached accessory units will cause the same thing that short-term rentals, non-owner-occupied rentals look like. Um, we don't need more accessory dwellings. We need more affordable housing. Um, the bill or the request spoke of density. Putting more houses that people still can't afford to live in doesn't create affordable housing. It, it 
the accessory dwellings will not look like the neighborhood. I live in a neighborhood where our lots are fifth, about a quarter of an acre. The accessory dwellings state here live in space. Um, this is the cons against this. One of two of the buildings shall be owner occupied. So that means that the owner can live in a primary dwelling and somebody else can live behind that house. The living space shall not exceed 700 square feet if the lots are 10,000 square feet or smaller. My lot is at least 10,000 square feet because it's a large lot. If it's 10,000 square feet or larger, they can put up to 1,000 square feet on this, on this lot. So how on earth would these dwellings be any different from non-owner occupied short-term rentals? The, the fine for non-owner occupied short-term rentals not having a license to do that, I, I don't think my two minutes are up. Our, um, yeah, it, unfortunately, <laughs> we... That was quick. It, it goes by... Me, so I need you, a few more minutes. Just, <laughs> Please. Um, how, about, how about 30 more seconds? I don't think I can wrap it up. I have three points, and then I'll be finished. The fines that are that um, non-occupied or short-term rental violators get is like $50. If I can make $1,000 on a weekend, who cares about the $50? Um, the passing of this zoning will only serve to circumvent the expiring of the short-term rentals going in effect in January. Although this zoning request is for a certain area, North Nashville is the first area of the city that this is being getting pegged on. It's a guinea pig. It's an experiment. And it's an experiment with the value of our land. And I, okay. So, so I appreciate it. Unfortunately, I get in trouble as the chair if we don't follow our rules. And so, you know, two minutes is two minutes. I've given you, I try to be very helpful and mm -hmm. we understand that. And if we have questions for you, the commissioners can ask those questions during discussion. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Thank you for coming down. Thank you for the opportunity. You were very articulate. We appreciate it. All right. So anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? <laughs> no, it's okay. Anyone else? Let's make sure we get, don't want anybody not to be able to speak. So seeing no one wish to speak, the applicant is not here, the uh, which is the council member. And so seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Commissioner Haynes, you want to go first? You haven't gone first yet. Thank you, Chair. So, Logan, can you answer her question and just educate us on the differences between what is allowed in a DADU and the short-term rental? Or Lisa, one of you two. So the, the zoning for these properties are residential. They're primarily RS and R6 zoning where short-term rentals are not permitted. So it'll only be residential use that is permitted in the DADU unit to the rear. So short-term rentals. Lisa. And just a little bit of nuance. So owner-occupied short-term rentals are permitted within RS zoning districts, but if you apply the DADU overlay and you build a DADU under that overlay, short-term rentals neither are permitted on that property any longer. Um, and so it would only be allowed for long-term rentals. That answers my question. I'm gonna support staff's recommendation. All right, Councilman. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, this is exciting to see this, uh, they do overly be applied to this, this area. Uh, it's something that's been contentious since at least 2015, even before Councilmember Johnston and I were elected, there had been an attempt at that time to create a day do overlay and, uh, and it uh, did not go over well and it was uh, withdrawn and we've had a couple of stabs at it since that time. And I know Councilmember Brooklyn Allen worked very hard uh, to bring it back thoughtfully and uh, to, we were able to pass that enabling legislation and I was one of the co-sponsors on that. And I'm really excited to see Councilmember Taylor uh, bring this tool to, to this area of North Nashville. Um, one of the things too, I just want to uh, uh, reference uh, is that um, you know when we had the uh, the March 2020 tornado, there were um, there were discussions kind of in different parts of the community, but uh, but of, of how to avoid displacement. 
and uh, some community groups uh, that are active in the North Nashville area and do a lot of services up there. One of the things that they actually presented during their, their presentation to that community was to say that, you know, there are, there are or should be opportunities for long-term home, homeowners in North Nashville to sort of take advantage of development opportunities to increase their wealth uh, through their land holdings and to create more affordable housing in the community. And this is exactly that. This creates a day-to opportunity that would be limited to residential uses. Um, and so it could increase the entitlements of those properties for those homeowners uh, and also create um, some affordable housing opportunities that we can control and ensure that they are uh, housing. So that really does tie, this really does tie into some conversations that have been going on in Nashville for a long time about how to avoid displacement of existing residents and create more opportunities for new residents to move into that neighborhood without you know, having all the houses be demolished. Um, the one thing I think I do want to ask staff just to speak to a little bit is for this, I know districts have to be contiguous and it looks like in this map, it kind of barely is because there is a piece where it crosses over, but just wanted to speak to the, the conti contiguity of the shape and also, um, <laughs> Just ensure I guess that, your cutoff, Gasper. Uh, ensure no, that, we're, we're, <laughs> that this district would meet those criteria, just number kidding. one. But also just wanted to speak to the presence of alleys throughout the area. Is this, how, how many of these parcels in this area would potentially be eligible to build day dues under those other conditions of the ordinance? So um, I'm sorry for the buzzer. Um, so it, it requires 30 contiguous lots. And so... This whole thing is connected, albeit by a small area, but each of the areas is 30 contiguous. And so it's meeting the standard in a few different ways. Um, when we originally saw this application, um, or before it was actually filed, Councilmember Taylor was working um, and had originally wanted to apply it sort of to a larger area. And we encouraged him to remove some areas because some of the areas that he was proposing to include in the overlay would actually not be eligible. And so we didn't want to include sort of large swaths of property that were not eligible for datos. Um, we don't want to set sort of a false expectation that someone may be able to have one when their property doesn't meet the standards, right? Um, and so what we were left with is that I think most of the properties in here would be. Now, if there's already a... Um, duplex on a property, it is of course not eligible even if it meets all of the other criteria because the maximum is two units per, per lot. Um, and so absent, uh, absent a duplex, um, and as long as it's got an alley, most of these lots are, are going to be eligible. Great. We well, work to get it whittled down. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you for that analysis. That's very helpful. And I think this is it's kind of to see this uh, move forward. Uh, hopefully, uh, I've, I'm in support of the staff recommendation. I'm looking forward to see this coming back before council. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think it, this is a really great opportunity. Uh, I'm so you know, excited to see the tool we recently adopted, and this is the best use of overlay. And I did not think this large area will be, you know, uh, utilized for that, but that's really exciting. You know, kudos to the council member Taylor to introducing this, uh, utilizing this tool. And I think this is really good to establish and keep the existing neighborhood, but at gentle density. So I'm all for it. Thank you, Commissioner Tibbs. Um, in principle, I'm for this too, but I do have a question. Did the councilman, did he have, I mean, this is a large swath. A lot of, you know, homes are affected. Were there community meetings and there were a lot? Of things? The, the council member did hold a community meeting, um, and I, I made sure and just confirmed that as well. Okay. Um, and so there was a community meeting. There um, was not a huge amount of uh, attendance, but he did have a community meeting and it was advertised. And um, he had felt like there were a couple of questions, but that he had worked through those questions. Yeah, that, that, that's the only, my only pause, because there are a lot of homes that are affected by this. And I, like I said, I, 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 I'm kind of with Commissioner Johnson. I, you know, I do think this is an opportunity actually for affordable homes, but um, with the, um, you know, the person who spoke uh, in opposition, 
I do question, I'm a little concerned that maybe the, the neighborhood doesn't know everything that's going on with it. And um, so, you know, if I know there's a lot of support for it, but I'd be very much wondering if, you know, if he'd be, you know, for a deferral for it. So we can make sure that it is, the message is out. There's so many homes that are affected by this that, that it's, you know, him not being here to able to even speak to her and maybe express the, any kind of concern she has. Maybe it can go away pretty quick and it's on consent next time, but um, that's my concern. I mean, it's it's gonna affect a lot of people and, you know, of course we don't have a lot of people for or against it, but, you know, here, but um, that, and you said it was the limited number that showed up. So I do have a little concern because of that. So I guess if, go ahead, Lisa. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, you know, notice was provided and so, um, and notices were then mailed for this meeting um, and, and signs, probably 30 or more signs were actually posted as well. Um, so there has been a significant amount of um, notification and outreach um, and, and yeah, so there has been a lot of outreach and notification and I know the council member has been speaking to people about it as well, so. Vice Chair. Um, I'm also excited to see this, um, but I share Commissioner Tibbs' concerns. Um, this is a large, a large overlay. Um, this area was just hit by the tornado. Um, there's a lot of redevelopment happening in that area. Um, I, I do feel like I would feel a lot better approving this if the councilman was here and could kind of explain the process a little bit more that he's gone through from an outreach perspective. Um, I don't know how many of the current property owners in that area are homeowners versus renters. And if there's a lot of renters, perhaps they haven't turned out for some of the public meetings. So I just, I guess I would feel better if I had heard from the council member kind of the community's support for this. I mean, we're kind of going off of a, of a map. <laughs> and, the, and what we've looked at to say where we think it makes sense from a policy perspective, but I, you know, I don't know if there is a rush on this, but if we had the opportunity for a one meeting deferral, I would feel a lot better if we could hear from the council person. So Lisa, what's the, um, is there a rush or what's the status at the council? There is a council bill that has been filed and the council member has been in contact with me. He is, he is having another community meeting. So that was why he was unable to attend tonight. And so he has done the outreach and, and felt like that that was um, sufficient. Um, and so he, uh, there is a council bill though. And there's a public hearing at council um, Tuesday. Oh, uh, Commissioner Tibbs, use your microphone, sir, please. Thank you. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, so I guess that means we really don't, can't defer it because it's a council bill is coming up on meeting next time. Is that what that means? Well, no, it doesn't. I mean, we, he could defer it as well. If Couldn't he, Lisa, or? So we're in a bit of an odd time with the planning commission and council schedules where we only have one meeting in November and that meeting is on the third Thursday of the month, which is not a normal meeting date for us because the second Thursday of the month is Veterans Day and the fourth Thursday of the month is Thanksgiving. And so with planning commission and the schedule, the way that council and bill filing and the deadline works um, a deferral here may mean that it could get through council without you all having weighed in. Um, yeah. So I, I, I too share that concern, but I think we do want to address our concerns that, and I think by publicly we've addressed those, um, but it's up to the commission on, on I, I, I don't want to try to create bad precedent of, you know, us not that becoming a regular practice. Um, Councilman, more discussion. Uh, thank you, Chair. No, thank you, Commissioners, for, for those points. Um, in my conversations with Councilmember Taylor, it's my understanding that he's been speaking with the community about this for a, a while. Um, and so uh, I know we don't have a lot of folks that are here, but uh, 
it's my understanding that he's been, uh, had actually been sort of contemplating this as a tool um, since before the most recent bill was, was introduced and passed um, because he sort of had folks that were wanting to do a day do and then he'd have to do an SP per lot and he didn't want to do that. So it's my understanding from Council Member Taylor that he's been contemplating this and thinking about this with his community for a while. Um, and I do want to sort of um, also state that um, I, I think sometimes some overlays, like even a contextual overlay or a conservation overlay, I'm, I'm a big proponent of both of those. But I think there's an argument for those that those are sort of restricting people's property rights in some way, whereas this one adds property rights to people. It doesn't take anything away from anyone. And so that makes me a little bit more at ease about this one, that we could move it to council, um, and then uh, hopefully council member uh, Taylor you know, we'll have a public hearing if council members feel like there hasn't been notice. The council members themselves could, could work for a deferral on that to allow more community time. But I think what I'm hearing from most of us here is that uh, it seems to meet policy and I think most people feel like it's generally a good idea um, for, for this area. But I, I just, uh, at this point, because this overlay doesn't restrict property rights, it adds entitlements and because it's, um, uh, like I said, something that I'm aware has been discussed for a while. I, I would would hope the commission would be comfortable moving it forward to council. Thank you. Well, that gives me a, little, a lot more comfort, but I um, definitely would encourage him, if there's any way maybe you can or can, to you know reach out to the you know, the lady who spoke here today and let her know kind of so there can be more conversation and if there's something that could be brought up in council to make sure that, um, you know, that the proper... Um, feedback from them because even though it's property rights it's still a it is it is a big swath you know I don't I don't know if I've seen this bigger swath so just I want to make sure that uh, you know that like uh, vice chair said it could be a lot of maybe there's a lot of rentals and there's people that just ha hadn't had a chance to weigh in on it who knows I'm, I don't want to make any assumptions at all but um, for this for this much if it was a smaller amount maybe I feel a little bit different but it's such a big amount so it, I, as long as I have some assurances that counts you know he will follow up I, I would feel better and more comfortable with uh, a voting staff recommendation thank you Commissioner. He, he's asked me to get to get the constituents information he's committed to reaching out um, tomorrow to, to have a conversation so I will um, okay. I will get that information and, and relay it to him so as the public can see, I mean, we were very concerned about outreach. We always want to be fair. And then as, as the councilman said, you know, yes, it's more property rights, but the neighbor may not like an, an additional person living next to them. So, I mean, it goes both ways. And I, we just want to make sure this bigger area. So we, we do pay attention. Okay. All right. So, Vice Chair, you were, it was your turn. You're the last speaker. We're ready I will, for. I will. Um, I guess I just have to register my concern, which is that I would like to see at the council meeting some representative of the neighborhood in support of this, because this is an area where we are concerned about displacement and adding property rights with a lot of renters in the neighborhood could increase the value for landlords to sell, but doesn't necessarily benefit the people who are currently living in that neighborhood. So I would really like to know that there is there are organized neighborhood groups in this area. I would like to know that they are aware and supportive. And um, if that can be conveyed to the council member, I would feel a lot better approving something like this. But um, for the sake of keeping it going and registering my concerns, um, I will make a motion that we approve staff recommendation. That's a proper motion. Council member, you want to second it? I, would, I will second and I will be sure to convey those comments to Councilmember Taylor. So thank, thank you. you. Any other That's, discussion? We'll Seeing no other discussion, all in favor say aye. Because no ayes have it. And so we are on to other business. Historic. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, no report for tonight. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Haynes, Parks. No report. All right. Executive Committee. I. Uh, I, um, so it is, we're coming up on the holidays. Make sure you look at the calendar. Uh, Vice Chair, we don't have anything else. I do want to recognize uh, Alex. He has someone to introduce to us.
Thank you. A brief moment of personal privilege. I want to introduce Ann Mickelson, if you would please stand up. She's going to be uh, working with on our team, so you may see her substitute for me. Uh, she is a uh, she has a PhD in English. I like to call her Dr. A, um, but she probably won't be using much of that in, in her work here. But I just want to introduce you all to her. Thank you, Alex. Welcome. We appreciate it. All right. So one other thing, uh, Chair, do we have a walking tour on Monday? Y yes, we have a walking tour. Is that right? Uh, why don't we go no, through that? I don't that. know if it's a walking tour. I think it's just a... Uh, a uh, work session for this first one, and then we're going to discuss things from there. Yeah, so, Lucy, so we, it's not a walking tour. I can wear my suit if I have to. I don't have to. <laughs> okay. All right. We just want to make sure. But if you all could come. The workshops are really important. It's where we interact and we learn a lot about the city, obviously, and, and we get in in-depth analysis and 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 it's just good for us as commissioners right director yes and this we have several plan sessions planned for downtown uh, which is experiencing lots of growth and change and i've been serving as a co-chair on a downtown um sort of strategic planning committee and i wanted to share a little bit about what we're learning we've invited the downtown partnership and other folks who really study market conditions because i think given the kind of cases that we're seeing uh, for new development, it's important to ensure that we understand or are responding to and thinking about sort of broader policy issues that we're dealing with in the city. And so we want to put that on the table for the hearing or for the meeting, excuse me. And what we will do a walking visit uh, on, at a subsequent session. So. And it's a, you're up, director's report. Oh. Thank you. I think that was my report. Okay. Um, I, uh, thank you. That's it. How about that? Oh, you want me to? Oh. So just as on a sort of professional note, I did want to say regarding the cases that we heard tonight and any others, you know, that you hear where you have a property owner who may not be supportive of a rezoning, I do want to put in the record, I take that very, very seriously. You will not see me coming forward making recommendations for new projects where there's opposition from the property owners. Um, but in, you know, I think in this particular case, there was a history there that I took into account. I just wanted to reassure you that that is not precedent that I, I think we should follow. We should be very, very careful. But this was a, a, a unique case. And so I just wanted to reassure you that that's something that I think we should all, and as a commission, take very seriously as well. Thank you, Director. I appreciate that. Uh, legislative update. Councilman? Um, the main thing on most council members' minds is redistricting. So um, I want to take this uh, time. I was able to stop by the uh, open houses at different parts of the county and want to thank our staff who spent endless amounts of time with constituents uh, drawing maps and doing all of those things and allowing people to test out like, well, if you move this area in, what do you have to take out to keep it balanced? I think that was really good hands-on experience just for constituents and neighborhood leaders and even us council members uh, to, to try to work that out. So uh, I think everyone is uh, really focused on seeing the next version of the maps that come out, uh, but just wanted to take this opportunity to thank our staff who spent many, many hours with constituents answering any questions they had and gathering feedback. And I know that will help to have a uh, uh, really good uh, plan for the next next two terms. Thank you, that's good feedback. Uh, all right, so that leads us to our uh, adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? We're adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.